I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. So, Bert, this is the year 297 of the Missouri. This is Bert, this is the year 297 of the year 297 of the year 297 Right, good evening, everybody. Um, I'm Kim Skillen, the Deputy Superintendent for Instruction. Um, and tonight we have a couple of presentations for you on some programs and some different activities that are going on around the district that we wanted to make sure you were all aware of. And tonight, um, we're the first presentation um, we're presenting. Um, we're really excited about the Common Language Program. Our students are have gone to 85 or first cohort is coming up in middle school. And um, the a committee was created with uh, teachers, administrators, parents to discuss then what is the pathway for these students from middle school to high school. So I'd like to invite out uh, Ms. Dana Muso, who is our ELA e and L director, Ms. Stephanie Massandres, who is the middle school, um, Robert Moses, uh, assistant principal, who is also the supervisor for the middle school school program, and Ms. Connelly Magandhi, who is a high school assistant principal and also the supervisor for the high school um, low program, and they're going to continue through um, all the work that this committee has done. And I have to say, these ladies have done a sensational job um, really bringing our low program into language program to another level. And we are going to allow presenters that they present tonight if they're staying distance to take off your mask because we know that we can totally be coupled um, online. So I'm going to turn it over to you guys. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for this opportunity to share our plan for this transition for our elementary and language students as they move on to the middle school. So um, it feels like yesterday, six years ago, I was standing up here with Ms. Olson as we were proposing a plan um, for a bilingual program here in North Avalon, and we decided to go with the new language uh, model for our students. And when doing that work, we set three overarching goals for this program. The first being bilingualism and biliteracy. So we want students to not only be able to um, speak in Spanish and in English, but also be able to read and write. Um, grade level academic achievement and an understanding, respect, um, and competence of understanding different cultures. So those goals were kind of um, guiding our work and thinking about what's going to happen next year starting with those. So just to give everybody a picture of what it looks like right now at the elementary level, our dual language program is a standalone model. So each grade has one class, one cohort of dual language students who have um, one teacher all day, aside from specials. They're a general classroom teacher who's duly certified in elementary ed and bilingual ed. Um, and that teacher instructs every day in English and Spanish. Um, our class, uh, we comprise a class of proficient speakers of both languages. So half the class are students who only know English, and the other half are students who are growing up in Spanish-speaking homes and are learning English. Um, the goal in a two-language program is that we try to have our instruction be 50-50 in both languages. And our model is an immersion model, so it's not that everything's taught is then translated. We're just immersing in the academic um, areas. Here are some other points on what it looks like in the day-by-day -day in the two-language classroom. Um, being that we have half the class English proficient and the other half um, Spanish proficient, or Spanish speaking, they're kindergartners when they come in. Um, every child is a language model to their classmates, which is pretty cool. When it's a Spanish um, lesson, the L's are the, Spanish, are the language model and vice versa when it's in English. Um, the teachers do explicit instruction during language arts on some foundational skills like phonics and grammar, English language arts, or on in Spanish language. Our two language teachers are amazing. They work so hard. And think about it, when you're learning science or math in a language that is brand new to you, the teachers are so creative. They include visuals, songs, physical activities, projects to really help make the content come to life. Um, what's really interesting is when you're learning in this type of program, you're learning the underlying principles of just how language works, which is not only setting up our students for learning English and Spanish in elementary school, but if they decide to study multiple other languages as they grow older and become multilingual, they have that clear understanding of just how phonics, phonological awareness, and just language works, which is pretty cool. And when they're moving from one language to the other, our teachers do what's called bridging. So if they're finishing, for instance, a Spanish uh, science unit in Spanish, um, they don't just go on to the next unit in English. 
they have a day where they might pull out some key concepts from what was taught in Spanish and some vocabulary and give the kids that in English so they have that understanding in both languages. Um, our two language program is a roller coaster model. So we have had um, revised it over the years with input from the teachers and we do um, half the day in English, half in Spanish. So for instance, if ELA was in the morning, math, science, and social studies in the afternoon, for two weeks at a time, morning is English, afternoon is Spanish. And then the following two weeks, it flips. We did that so that teachers can really get through a specific math topic or science unit in one language, rather than switching the language and the, and the, the unit as well. So we've been, over the last six years, really listening to our teachers and our students and parents and, and um, revising it as we go. Um, and now, as we have our first class in fifth grade, we wanted to look at the data for that goal of grade level academic achievement. So we looked at our most recent, from a week or so ago, STAR data in English. And for re STAR reading, our dual language class of fifth graders scored 10% above the district average. Um, for math, they were 7% above the district average in STAR math. Um, when looking at all of our fifth grade classes ranked, our dual language class was ranked in the top 30, 30, 30% for ELA and in the top 40% for math. So that, um, thank you. And it just made us, um, you know, they're learning more, right? They're learning another language. So to see that um, that hard work, they're still able to keep up with their peers. And this is all in-district data um, and showing that they're still meeting those, those goals is really remarkable. Um, and we do, you know, this was to look at just our, our how they compare to the monolingual classrooms, but we are seeing um, great gains in Spanish as well, which will help them as they, as they go to middle school. Um, so we had originally made this program because the CR Part 154 regulations state that if a district has um, 20 students in one grade level who speak the same language, we have to offer some kind of bilingual education program. Um, so we've really met that number every year so, um, for the last six years. Just so you see some stats over here, for this current school year, 119 of our kindergartners came from bilingual homes. We tested them all and we screened them all as per um, New York State regulations. 32 of those students tested in this house. So not all students who come from bilingual homes are English language learners. We, we give them this, this data set for assessment to measure that. 23 of those 32 students are from Spanish speaking homes. Um, looking at our current um, registration for incoming K for next year, as of last Friday, we have 69 students from bilingual homes, 40 of um, whom speak Spanish. So I think it's safe to say, looking at our historical data, that once again, we need the requirement for continuing with a um, bilingual program, which is exciting. Um, I have linked in here a video comparing our kindergarten, our fifth graders when they were kindergartners um, and now. And it's really interesting to hear them speak in both languages. Due to the packed agenda, we're not going to show the video, but it's linked in the, the presentation. Um, and now we're talking about middle school. Oh, no. <laughs> really wants to show you they're adorable. Thank you. Um, so when we were um, doing this committee work and thinking about what's next as they go to middle school, um, they're way above starting at that intro to Spanish class. So we thought of, all right, how, what are we going to call this pathway? And we uh, decided on enriched Spanish language students. So this would um, really refer to any student who's coming into middle school with a strong set of Spanish language skills. So many of those students will be those who went through the dual language program. And we're also expanding that to any students who may come from a Spanish speaking home where they can demonstrate um, strong literacy skills, reading, writing, listening, and speaking in Spanish through a district developed um, end of fifth grade assessment in Spanish. So I know I threw a lot out there. Now I'm gonna pass it over to Mrs. Saunders at the middle school to talk about what that pathway will look like. Thank you. Hi everyone. So we're really excited this year to have uh, the first cohort ever of dual language students coming to Robert Moses Snow School. I'm very excited. <laughs> sorry. So then you just left out of that Okay, sorry. Sorry about that. Yeah. Well, at least I'm keeping it interesting. <laughs> so what are the benefits of um, 
being in the English Spanish language program. One of the great benefits is our students that are coming, that will be part of this enriched um, Spanish program, they will be leaving Robert Moses with three high school credits, which is pretty um, amazing. By the time they get to the high school, they would already have met, hopefully the, uh, they would have met the advanced regents requirement for language. Um, in addition to that, once they enter the high school, they'll be able to um, take different courses, advanced level courses at an earlier age. Uh, they will also be candidates for the seal of biliteracy at the end of their ninth grade year. And again, if they choose not to continue studying language, they'll have a little bit more freedom in their schedule for different types of electives that they might be interested in studying. So, what does the what does the program look like, and how does a program into, uh, of an enriched Spanish um, how does an enriched Spanish schedule look uh, different and what's similar to their peers in sixth grade? So, what are the similarities? The similarities is every sixth grader will take their four co uh, core subject areas, uh, which is science, math, social studies, and English. Every um, student will take that. They'll all have a full year of family consumer science, which will run every other day, opposite of health for half year, or opposite of either exploratory load, or opposite of uh, cultural studies, and I'll explain that a little bit more further. Every sixth grader will take a full year of PE, and that will run every other day, opposite art, half a year, or opposite music, half a year. What are the differences? The only differences in the two programs of our enriched Spanish um, student schedule compared to their sixth grade year is the differences is in the 10 week class that we see. One is, one is exploratory load. So this, their sixth grade peer will take a class called exploratory load. What that looks like is they take five weeks in Spanish, five weeks in Italian, and then at the end, of that semester, a student decides in sixth grade which language they want to pursue, either Italian or Spanish, and then they follow that language for two years consecutively, and at the end of those two years, they take uh, the checkpoint A assessment in eighth grade. In the other program, a student that is transitioning from the dual language program into Robert Moses, their 10-week course will look very different. That 10 week course will focus on one of the standards from Checkpoint A uh, assessment, and that will be a cultural studies class that focuses more on the traditions um, and customs of foreign language uh, countries in Spanish. And that curriculum is going to be written this summer. Um, the eighth period class also looks very different. So these are the only two differences in the sixth grade schedule. They're almost identical except for those two differences. Like I said, the 10 week course looks different and that eight period class looks different. So the eight period class for a student that has enriched Spanish, that class will be a full year Spanish class that will focus on the four modalities of reading, speaking, listening, and writing. And that will culminate in the checkpoint A assessment that a student will take in sixth grade and Upon passing it, they'll get one high school credit, which is really quite amazing. The other class, which is compared to their peers, that's different. The other sixth graders, they take a class called exploratory content areas. So what that is, it's like a project-based learning, and they take that in science, math, social studies, and English. So that's the only differences in the two programs. What will it look like? So what will the pathway look like for our, our student that is now in rich Spanish, um, in the rich Spanish program? It looks quite amazing actually, because they can get three high school credits, like I said, and I want to explain how they get it. So if you look in their sixth grade, when their sixth graders will take the 10 week course, like I said, in cultural um, studies, and that will go opposite family consumer science. They will also take the enriched Spanish one class that's a full year course that will be done during that eight period class, which I explained. And then they'll take a checkpoint A assessment, and upon um, passing that, they'll receive one high school credit. And then upon completing that successfully, they will transition into seventh grade, where they'll take enriched Spanish two, 
And in the enriched Spanish 2 class, they will actually um, take a, a final, and upon passing that final, they'll get another additional high school credit. And then they'll transition to eighth grade. Uh, and the eighth grade, that will culminate in the checkpoint B exam. So uh, the middle school kids that are transitioning from the dual language uh, program in fifth grade will leave middle school with three high school credits. Like I said, it's quite amazing. And they'll already be on the track for an, uh, towards an advanced regions credit in language. So again, now we're going to focus on three years down the line as, as these students, as our new language students are transitioning out of the middle school, what will their options be for the high school? And the options in the high school are, they can come in and take a ninth grade, they can take a Spanish 4 class, which we offer uh, as a dual enrollment class where students can get credits through something community college beacon program. They could also opt to take the AP Spanish course, or if they choose to continue studying language, they would be able to opt to now start to begin studying Italian, and they would take an Italian 1 class. Um, so, let, we're, uh, Mrs. Sondra spent some time talking about what does it look like, what are the high school graduation requirements for world language, and generally speaking, a student, in order to graduate high school, needs one credit in a foreign language. There's two different ways that you can, you can, you can earn that credit. By completing 7th and 8th grade sign, uh, Spanish or Italian and passing the checkpoint A exam, or completing one level of Spanish or Italian at the high school. Our students who complete this program will have taken uh, all three levels of Spanish that was necessary and complete the checkpoint B exam to earn those credits. The other exciting part about this is that the students who transition to the high school will be excellent candidates for our seal of biodiversity. And the seal of biodiversity is a seal that actually goes on the students' high school uh, diploma once they graduate high school, when they're able to demonstrate proficiency and biliteracy in English and another foreign language. So, or another language, actually. So, the students here would be able, um, the requirement in the, in the other language would be a checkpoint level C class. So, students, the Spanish 4 or the AP 4 would count as that checkpoint C level course, and the majority of those students would only need to participate and complete a project in that language in order to earn that biodiversity seal. They have to earn three points, so between the project and that course, they can earn that points in the ninth grade, that's the end of their ninth grade year, and then they can focus um, achieving those points and credits for the English side and earn that on the English side. So that's a really exciting part of this program, and we're hoping that these students will be great candidates for this uh, seal of biodiversity. <clears throat> what are the goals for uh, enriched world language students? Students are expected to study language starting in middle school as part of their graduation pro program the requirements. They're given the opportunity to take AP and college level classes in Spanish in an earlier grade level. They'll be prepared to take and earn, actually, the New York Seal of Biliteracy on their diploma. And it also gives them an opportunity to, to pursue and explore different types of courses in language or in other areas that they would be interested in studying. Okay. So thank you, ladies. You know, it really is an impressive program that we have, that our kids in our dual language program are exceeding our expectations in both English and in Spanish, um, which is really neat. And if you do get a chance, the presentation will be on the website. The link to watch the video, it's the kindergarten, it's our current fifth grade, when they were kindergarten students and where they are now. So to see their growth um, in both English and Spanish is, is pretty amazing. Um, and the idea that the students will come out of middle school with three credits of high school and the advanced regents diploma credit and be able to get a college, take a college course as ninth graders, um, I think really um, speaks volumes to the work that our elementary um, teachers have done to prepare our students to get here. Um, I can't thank these ladies enough for the amount of work that they thought they have put in with the committee and the parents and the teachers to really think through a pathway straight to um, to 12th grade to make sure our students are successful. Um, at this point, you know, I'd like to open it up to the Board of Ed if you have any questions about 
um, the pathway or about anything in the presentation? I did have one question I just didn't understand. It. Just a few slides back when it came to the ninth grade one. Yeah. Um, that one, I think, yeah. yeah. So Spanish four, one high school credit. So that's available at Suffolk, not in our, not here. So it's 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 offered, um, we call it like a dual enrollment class. So the students take the course here. Uh, we have students in the class right now, okay. and they're able to enroll in the class here, and they also can register and take credits through Suffolk Community College. Okay, but so it's, it's not one they have to be busted Suffolk Correct. Like that it's one, one that they're, they're here. Okay, um, there is a caveat there also just that those students, when they enter ninth grade, they would probably be in courses with 11th and 12th graders because our traditional students might not be eligible to take Spanish 4 until their junior year. Right. Perfect. I actually have a question. So, I mean, it's a wonderful, it's a very elite program. Right. And I believe you said that there's probably 40 ELL students that are coming into kindergarten next year. Can you tell us, because um, again, it's one class per grade, how many ELL students, how many English speaking students, and then what happens with those students who are ELL that aren't able to, I guess, make the cut of that class? So we have filled the class and we try to keep it 11 or 12 students from each um, language. So 11 L's, 11 or 12 L's, and we balance that out with the English proficient students to keep it around uh, under our you know, um, class size cap. So then we, the, with the student, let's say, was enrolled to go to MGV, they then are moved to Parliament if you are a student that's selected for that program. If you are an L and you do not um, qualify for the program, you go to the school which you are registered. So if you were registered for MTV, you go to MTV and you get ENL services there. And we leave that option optional to the parents as per um, the regulations where we say we think your child would be a great candidate for dual language and this bilingual class, um, would you like it or not? So not all 40, if they all test in, they all, always don't choose because there's other, uh, we lay it all out there for them. You know, you would have to change your home school. Uh, sometimes they have siblings or, you know, neighbors that they want to be with, so it's not that they all come in. So we've been pretty, um, over the past few years, we've been able to keep it to one cohort per grade. So just, again, not being an elementary person, sure. what is the typical ELL, um, I guess, intervention, per se, the, the services that are given, um, I don't know, per week? In, in a dual language class? Not in a dual general. language, no, that was clear. Yeah, I was just no, wondering those students it, that it didn't make it. It depends on the child's level. It would, would depend on um, what, how much service they get, how much push and pull out, how much service they would get. Yeah. Um, so there's five levels. So if they're the entering or emerging level, emerging level in um, elementary school, they get pulled out two times a day, 35 minutes each, and they get one of those times is called standalone piano. It's more about the um, foundational and the, and the grammar skills and that newcomer ENL stuff. Um, and then the other period is called integrated ELA ENL, where the ENL teachers, in alignment with the classroom teachers, they teach an ELA curriculum with language scaffolds built in. Sometimes it's pulled out, sometimes we've been able to, in some of the buildings, have them co teach with the classroom teacher if that makes more sense for the kids. So it depends on their level, it could be one to two times a day at their home school for ENL. Thank you. Uh, three, three quick questions. Sure. All right, but they're really fast. Okay. Uh, very impressive. Thank you for the presentation. Um, how many students do we average uh, to receive the seal by literacy? How many students do we have that go on once they finish Spanish? Do they take Italian or another language? And is there a relationship with this program and our uh, teacher that takes kids traveling to So Europe. I'll answer that last question and I'm going to turn to Sul Gandhi and then to the other two. The last question is um, there is not a relationship right now because the kids are in middle school. But that doesn't mean as the students get to the middle school, uh, to the high school, that that teacher does an outside program who does these trips. She may encourage those students they may be attracted to go with her. But that program of traveling out is completely outside the district. It just happens to be a teacher who's employed here who does that on the summer and vacations. And kids are attracted to it because they happen to really enjoy her. So currently we've had approximately 10 students eligible for the seal by literacy. Uh, we are excited uh, and hopeful for more kids to be eligible because this year we uh, implemented the, the level four class, which is still considered a checkpoint C uh, class where the kids can earn the point towards the seal by literacy by taking that class. So that we are excited about, and next year we have 
we're running three sections of Spanish four, um, and we're still running a combined section of uh, Italian for an AP, but the numbers are super high, so I'm hoping that the following year we can implement two. So we're excited about um, the opportunity to have more kids eligible because they don't have to uh, opt for the AP level. Um, so we're hopeful that, that that number will increase. And the second question, Mr. Myers, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, you mentioned that once you finish the language, you might have an opportunity to take another language. Sure. Do we currently have students that are doing that? No, we do not. We do not currently have students that we're doing uh, that are doing that because right now we have only we're only offering Italian two at the high school. So we have the Spanish one because some all of our students are not coming to us with a foreign language credit when they enter, but we do not offer Italian one. So when this cohort of students comes up, if all of them are interested and in we have enough to enroll, we could definitely run the section of Italian one. Okay. But we're not currently. Maybe based on student interest, we would decide the schedule. Thank you. Any other questions? Before that, uh, don't kill the messenger. But if you don't have your mask on, could you please put your mask on? It's not our rule, it's New York State. We'll get into that later. So please no confrontation now. Let's all just work together. We're getting these educational uh, studies here for us. And uh, we'll just we'll discuss all that later. So if we just all cooperate, I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Anybody have any questions? For our presentation, people. Sounded good, though, didn't it? Great. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you for complying with the mask. We'll discuss all that. Thank you. So, this actually um, translates very nicely into. Um, I'm going to skip over UPK now because this transitions nicely into this. Um, position of director of ENL and LOAP that I'm recommending to the Board of Education that we have been discussing. Um, you'll see later on in another presentation through our federal stimulus funds how this kind of gets branched into there. But I wanted to introduce this tonight um, to take a look at what does the data tell us in ENL. So if you look back at a snapshot of the last 10 or 11 years, you'll see that we start in 2011, we had about 176 students and five ENL teachers. And as you go through the years, you'll see we're averaging over 300 kids now. And this year we have 322. We have 13.4 ENL teachers, six dual language teachers, and 19.4 in that department for ENL. When you look at the data in LOAP, okay, you look at the number of teachers, and we have been expanding our LOAP program since the Board of Education has implemented the full middle school LOAP program into the building. Not only are are we needing to increase teachers at the middle school, but we have to increase at the high school because more kids are going into these advanced courses that Ms. Lagani spoke about, the level fours, and we want to make sure we have opportunity for our students. So if you look, we really have transitioned from 11 teachers in low to 16. When you look at the number of teachers in both departments, now this does include elementary ENL, but we're around 35.4 teachers in ENL and low right now. I did some comparisons, but I do want to make a, a comment here that this is just secondary. Because if you look at the director of English, not only is she doing ENL now, but she also works with all the elementary teachers in teaching of reading in the classroom, and she supervises the reading AIS teachers. The same with the math and the social studies. They also work K-5 with teachers in those areas in their department. I did this number includes our elementary ENL as well as our secondary. So when you look, the ENL and LOAC department has become a very um, large program in the district. So the current structure for ENL is that it's supervised by Dana Musso, who is just up here as our director of English. <coughs> she holds all the department meetings, is responsible for the Title III grant, which is the grant that we get to help support us in our ENL program, and she ensures district compliance in Part 154. She's responsible for most of the formal observations in that department, in addition to the English department. She's responsible for reviewing the teacher's plan books and grade books and textbook selection, curriculum writing, and any state assessments. She works with teachers regarding parent concerns in the ENL department. She supervises the dual language program along with Mr. Olson, the building principal. And she also helps us with exam translations and our proprio system, which helps us communicate with parents who are um, non-English speaking. 
The current structure of the load is load is supervised by the middle school assistant principal, Ms. Sassandras, who you saw here, and the high school assistant principal, Ms. Lagandi. They hold all the department meetings and they do the work within that department of supervising curriculum, reviewing plan books and grade books. Um, they attend as assistant principals directors meetings. Um, they supervise the World Language Honor Societies and act in the capacity of a director along with their assistant principal responsibilities. So in developing a mission and a vision for our ENL and World Language program, um, we talk about ensuring that we're building a program that meets our students' needs and that prepares students for post-secondary education. In doing that, I developed a role and responsibility of a director of ENL and LOAD where they would work directly with the deputy superintendent, Ms. Skillen, like the other directors, promote student engagement and success within the department, work with the other directors towards the educational aims of the district, and really take on the roles and responsibilities we have in all of our other departments, but work together with the ENL and LOAD department. These are some continued roles and responsibilities, monitoring and refining the scope and sequence of our courses, looking at whether we need new textbooks or course curriculum or additional subject areas, maybe more partnerships for college and AP courses, um, manage the budget within that department, and manage the administrative tasks and any funding that's relevant to the curriculum. <clears throat> they would look at um, coordinating the program that serves students who are limited English proficient. They consult with Ms. Skillen regarding federal, state, and local policies, monitor the Title III grant, um, coordinate staff development, and do professional development, and ensure we're compliant with Part 154. So where do we go from here? The way that this process works is that I make a recommendation to the board about creating a position. The board would have to approve the creation of a position. We would have to post the position and then hire a qualified candidate. In estimating the cost of this position, this is the current director salary scale range. You look at medical benefits and payroll costs that go along with it, and it costs approximately, on average, about $210,000 to have a director of a department. In that, you'll see later on, in our federal stimulus fund that I have written up here, the cost of this position would be funded through our federal stimulus plan that we're recommending to you tonight, where the cost would come out of that federal stimulus plan. And then during these three years, we would look at how do we make this fit into our general fund budget over a scaffold of three years getting it to be a part of our general fund budget to continue that position. Comments and questions? Anything from the board? Yes. Um, two things. I, I couldn't see, I don't know if it mentioned it, but will this person also deal with psych students and the students that are, uh, have a, a, a relationship with uh, Stress, and social, emotional. Stress. Yeah. So in that department, in the ENL department, when we're working with psych students, we provide that support, the social, emotional support, in collaboration with the psychologists and the social workers. And this leader would be in charge of helping the staff support family and students in our school who may be absent of any educational experience at all coming to our school district or have gaps in their instruction. Absolutely. Please talk a little bit about using the, um, you know, the federal stimulus money for that. Um, and then, obviously, as we move along, we've seen different things happen throughout the districts. I, I hate to create that and then have to stress about it over the next three years and how to keep it here. So, can you just speak to me? About yeah, so more about the that? idea of putting it in the federal stimulus funds now is that we can utilize that money to support it in the entrance of the first three years. It then also allows us an opportunity to look at our current fund, general fund expenditures. What is our state aid projection? And remember, we always create a budget that supports our mission, vision, and core beliefs. So if we want to continue to grow this program, we would adjust and modify current general fund expenditures to channel funds to this area so that it would continue and not be a position where we say, well, we have it for three years and we're going to have to get rid of it because we can't afford it. It would give us three years as a leadership team with the business office 
to work together in getting to a point three years from now where it's a part of our general fund and not impacting our tax cap or other programs. How does it qualify? Excuse me? How does it qualify? How does it qualify? Um, is there a certain you want to talk about? So um, part of the federal stimulus money that you see in the net presentation, uh, a couple of presentations now, has to do with learning loss. And one of the things that we've looked at um, in analysis of our students is that um, we're seeing a significant delay in our L students and an increase in Ls. Dana said that 69 students of the current um, K registrants for next year are coming from um, homes that speak a different language, right? That's actually 40% of the current enrolled students for next year. So we're seeing an increase in the number of ENL students in the district, and the current structure is not, it, Dana is, Amazing. I don't want to take anything away from Dana, but Dana is, was hired to do ELA, and this job is growing significantly. So the stimulus money allows us to focus this on a particular group of students that we feel need additional support um, in order to help them graduate. The other thing that we've noticed in doing our data analysis is that we're finding a significant number of our ENL students struggling with some of the graduation credits, and we really need to focus on how can we support them to be successful in not only achieving a high school diploma, but seeing a pathway for themselves post-secondary? And so with this position, we would be able to do that as well. So it would help us with our transition planning for students that are ENL or former ENL. In analyzing our data, the parent dashboard that we talk about when we talk about college and career ready, and you get rated one through four. And two years ago, we were two, and now we're a four. It is projected that we're going to be a three, and when we analyze that data, we see that we are struggling with our ENL population hitting the mark at advanced regents diploma level. So we really believe that through identifying this as learning loss and support for our ENL program, it's a great opportunity because we have talked about this load is expanding because of all the courses that we need some structured supervision and support of the program. So it was a way to combine two things at once and be able to put it under the federal and really develop an ENL program. So we have developed ENL services and we have services in our elementary school and we have services in our middle school and high school. But what does the program look like and how do we set goals to kid for kids to pass the assessment to get out and to pass regents exams and English regents exams? It will also this, help, I'm also, sorry. The other way this fits in is because we're removing some responsibilities away from the assistant principals, there's an SEL component to the stimulus money, and there's a component in there about concentrating on the individual needs of students. Again, Colleen and Stephanie do a wonderful job, but with supervising such a large department, it does pull away from the work they can do individually, so they'll be able to really be able to focus in on the individual SEL, emotional, behavioral work that we really need in both those elements. Thank you. Sorry. That's okay. Any other questions? You knew I would. Um, no, I am concerned that you have, you have three years to figure out how to work that into the budget. But in that three years, you're also going to have to hire additional teachers on you as the program moves forward. Or so the, the or staff that we just that? saw in there is the staffing that will be able to manage current levels. but. We may be adding more load because, like Ms. Lagani said, she's running an Italian class now, a high-level Italian, almost at capacity. So as kids are really motivated by our load exploratory and picking languages in the middle school, kids are now able to get checkpoint A at the end of eighth grade, and these dual language kids will have it at the end of sixth grade. We need to add staff in order to appropriately staff higher levels of language. That will significantly help advanced regents diplomas for kids because they'll be able to check off the language component. And also, being multilingual will be a great asset on college um, application time. So I do believe there may be an addition or two of additional low teachers as we look how things progress. But right now, we're adequately staffed for where we are at this point. Okay, so my concern, though, is if you were at this position this year and then next year you have to get more teachers, it, it, over the course of three years, it would be a lot of positions, and I worry that the budget won't be able to support it. So okay. that's why you have us. So we will always be under tax cap or at tax cap because that's the direction the board has always given us in doing our job. And we believe in analyzing our general fund budget that we will be able to look at transitioning some of our expenditures into more grant funds 
transitioning some of our other programs because also, as we make shifts, we only have a finite number of kids. So we have to evaluate if they're all starting to go toward the language, what areas are we not filling now? So we have to look at transitioning programs and who's teaching what. Any other questions? Great. You can get it. So for the Board of Ed, I will have um, a resolution for the, the June um, 17th meeting recommending this position. Um, and we can have more discussion there if you think of questions that you guys have between now and then at that night. Another presentation for you. Um, so we're now going to talk about universal uh, pre kindergarten. And with me tonight um, to present is um, Ms. Harry, Mrs. Harry Lark, who's the principal of MGV, Mr. Drew Olson, who is the principal of Harlem Place, and our brand new math director, who's been here a few months, so putting her right into the, yes. into the place, is um, Amy Mark, who is brand new with us as a math director and is a part of this committee um, to look at a universal pre K. Uh, this is the, the team that has been working on our universal pre-K um, program and development to, that we're presenting here tonight as a possibility. As you can see, there are some board members on the committee, some parents on the committee, teachers, a, 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 a paraprofessional who also is a community member, and uh, we have administrators and um, a school psychologist on the committee. So all we could all, we thought we had a lot of great different team members in here working on this. So why is pre-K important? One of, we did an analysis a couple of years ago of our incoming kindergarten students, and we found that nearly 40% of our incoming kindergarten students have no pre-K experience, but many of them are either in a child care that does not provide any sort of educational experience, or in a household um, where a neighbor or a family member watches them during the day. And we saw that impact on our star data, as many of our students weren't K-ready. But pre-K is important because pre-K gives us the opportunity for growth, it prepares students for kindergarten. It gives children the opportunity to develop self-regulation skills, interaction, teachable moments, children to make choices. Uh, children learn how to take care of themselves and others. Pre-K promotes the development of language, cognitive and motor skills, and pre-K environment nurtures the students' creativity and curiosity. Activities boost pre-math and pre-literacy skills. So the program is designed to really help students transition to school in one of our schools and do it in a way that is fun and engaging because all of our classes are fun and engaging all the time, right? So what about universal pre-K? Why is this happening now? So universal pre-K uh, refers to the state government funding for pre-school pre programs that are free to those who attend it. So this would be a 100% free program for any North Babylon family with a student that qualifies, meaning their age is the qualifier. As long as this funding stays in place, we will be able to um, continue the program. But we have to look at human resources, and we also have to look at our space to coordinate what type of program we'd be able to offer with the grant money we're receiving. So as of July 2021, this is why this became such a big deal. The state went and they invested $97 million into the pre-K program, $970, thank you, million dollars into the pre-K program across the state. So districts who did not have pre-K programs received funding for the first time in order to have a program. So we were excited and put a committee together and say, what can we do? What can we pull off as, a, as an opportunity? Our district was allocated $669,000 in change, uh, which is a $6,000 per student allocation. And that's based on our age ratio, what our per student allocation is. The $669,000 is our maximum allocation but really we need to pay attention to the 6,000 number. The maximum number of students that we could, be, we could serve based on that number is 110 students. But we have to think about um, the fact that we need to set aside 10% of these funds to eligible agencies in the North Babylon zip code or serve North Babylon families to assist us with running a UK program, a UK program, so we have to put an RFP for that. The reason why that $6,000 is important is because when developing the program, we will only receive the grant funds for the number of students enrolled. 
so we can get up to the 669,000. But if we only had 10 students, it would be different. We would only get this money. And that's really important in planning this because there's so much that goes into funding a program like this. So I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Laura and Ms. Barrett Olson to kind of talk a little bit more about the basics and where we're going from here. <laughs> All right, good, good evening. I'm just going to tell you a little bit about what we envision about our uh, pre-K program. Super excited because that's what pre-K four-year-olds are, super excited about everything, and that's what we want them to be. Um, the program would be housed in Marion Together Elementary School. It has to be um, a five-day, full-day program based on the grants um, stipulation. We're figuring it would run approximately the same hours as an elementary school day, which would be around 9 to 2.45, 9 to 3. We're looking at about 15 students per classroom. Uh, with 15 students, they do ask that there is a teacher and a para in a classroom of 15. If we go over that to 18 or 20, they want us to have one teacher and two paras in a classroom of that size. The age range would be four years old prior to December 1st of this year. Um, the teacher or the staff for that particular class should be New York State certified. They would either have a pre-K to six. Those of you who know anything about certification, that means you're a little bit older. The certification has changed to now birth to second. So they would have to have either of those certifications. And then of course, we would need a paraprofessional for approximately seven hours in the room and a cafeteria aid for a lunchtime or a break in the room. Okay. Bonuses, we also have access in our elementary schools to a full-time psychologist, part-time social worker, a school nurse. Um, we would expect to use our special area teachers for physical education, art, music, and use of our libraries. We already have built-in technology in all the elementary classrooms, so the students in pre-K would benefit from the smart board also from the Chromebooks we have. We have speech therapists on staff, and we also have the ability to bring in OTPT and behavior intervention, um, if necessary, for the classes. And as everyone has just spoken about, the wonderful L support, we also have ENL support in our buildings for our pre-K students. Okay. A classroom, this is just some areas of importance in a pre-K room. Um, Many moons ago, I was a director of a preschool, actually three to six years old, and we had creative play centers. It uh, wasn't called STEM at that time, but the STEM activities that you've all heard about, science, technology, mathematics, skill centers. You would also want to have an area that was print rich for the students to learn and begin to be immersed in literacy throughout the day. I know. We're talking a little bit about math, so would you like to speak a little bit about math? Yes, so we can talk a little bit. What does math look like in a pre-K class? So, oh. so yeah, in a in a pre-K classroom with math, we are, we're going to do lots of worksheets, and now that's a joke. We're going to do <laughs> so. It's not going to be worksheets. It's going to be more um, creating um, conversations and the curiosity of the child and how many. How many uh, goldfish did you want with your lunch, Ms. Jessica? Too many. <laughs> Too many. Uh, and if you shared that with your neighbor, so that's the adding. And so it's going to be through those conversations with the students. Um, there's really five components with math. There's the um, understanding the number sense and promoting that number sense, as well as algebra, actually algebra in pre-K, and that would look like grouping, so perhaps um, putting all the green things together or the big trucks together. And then once those concepts are understood, then we would have uh, discussions and move into having, um, well, what if we take some of those items away? What happens now about the, with the groups? And then moving into patterns, which is a big piece of math and understanding patterns. Then moving into um, geometry, which is obviously uh, shapes and sizes but also understanding the language. And this is a, a time when you can introduce above, below, inside, next to, and talking math and speaking and just in, incorporating that into the language of the, the, of the students. Um, and then, uh, let's see, data uh, analysis, 
data analysis, RAM crackers, or Oreos? I mean, these are important questions to ask in the pre -pay. So, and we all know the answer is Oreos. There is only one right answer. So, um, but seriously, this is, we, we don't want this to be um, something that is just plug and chug, but it's more creating that curiosity and making that those moments for students, for the children to be excited about math and their own ideas, what they're thinking of, what they want, how the distance and measurement, measurement as things that they're curious about. So that's great. And I think the, the key word you said was readiness because so much of what we would do in a pre-K program is get our students ready. Ready socially, ready emotionally, ready academically for uh, what lies ahead of them, not just for kindergarten, but for all of their educational career. These are different supplies we would imagine we would need in a new pre-K classroom. Uh, tables, chairs, we would want to have colorful carpets, things that the students can use, fine motor skills, gross motor skills, um, introduction to the alphabet, crayons, creativity, markers, art, paint, all of those things that we would want to see in a very active and full, robust learning environment. Uh -huh. I didn't mean to say that. <laughs> That's my overarching thing. <laughs> um, a typical schedule, uh, if you were in a full day pre-K, you would deal with arrival. There would be a circle time. Sometimes people call that a calendar time or SDL time. You have skill centers which would rotate. You want the students to be moving about the classroom in different areas, the, the tape or tabletop activities they might have been called in another time where the students were working on different skills. You would have a snack or a rest time, a quiet time. You would have story time, reading and math. You would have a special activity, whether it be music coming in and working with instruments or then going to the um, gym and using uh, skills such as uh, skipping and running and jumping and uh, catching and throwing. Those are all basic things they should work on. They have access to the library, being able to have story time with the librarian, as well as being able to take out books from our library, especially especially set up for pre-K readers or pre-readers. We have creative play centers where students could explore. Um, Things as simple as socialization in a how do you pretend and play that we don't have as much time for in our kindergartens, but students need how to socially interact in those ways, how to wait their turn, how to share, how to be patient. All of those things are so very important. We have the use of our playground, which would be beautiful to have players out there. Also, um, independent play and circle back again with some more either reading or math and then end the day on a positive note with another SEL experience and then prepare for dismissal, which in the winter takes longer than 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there are resource guides for pre-K. There's a ton of standards. Many of the uh, skills that uh, Mrs. Michaelopoulos was talking about He's dead. <laughs> are found in the standards generated by New York State. These are some pre-K early literacy, early learning standards. Literacy, reading foundations, pre-reading, writing, speaking, listening, approaches to learning, mathematics, science, social studies, and social emotional learning. There's also standards for arts and physical education. They would like us to focus on dance, media art, music, visual arts, and theater at the four-year-old level, as well as physical development, physical fitness, physical health, and physical safety. These goals were developed by the committee, uh, the teachers, and uh, our school psychologists shared this with us during our committee meeting. So these all come from what the present teachers here in North Babylon feel they would like to see a pre-K program present and prepare those students for uh, the learning ahead. It's a little small, but in the, uh, there's academics from letters to knowing their address, body parts, patterns, um, colors, shapes, etc. Also fine motor, doing things like using a pair of scissors correctly, tracing, copying, washing their hands, using the bathroom independently, opening their own supplies and their own lunch, gross motor skills, as I mentioned before about PE, social emotional development, 
taking turns, using the words appropriately, proper eye contact, and appropriate behavior. Your turn now yeah. to turn the So before, over. We, before we, we move into that, Mr. Olson, can you talk a little bit about, as a principal, why some of those skills are very important, how the PK program could develop that? Right. So yeah. happy you asked me to speak, because now I get to take this off. Yeah, and now we're going to pass, we're ready to pass out. Um, but anyway, you'll notice I'm wearing a name tag tonight also. My son made this for me before I walked out the door. Um, he spelled my name right and gave me the free tag. So, uh, <laughs> I was lucky enough, I think it was in 2012, to be able to uh, run a, a pre-K program. We hosted a pre-K program at uh, Parliament Place Elementary through school. Um, it was very exciting. And I believe we ran it for three years, and then I had to give it up. And I was sad. And, and Mel Jackson has been running it in her building ever since. And I was sad because we saw it grow from a half-day program into a double half-day program. It was never a true full-day program. Um, kids are adorable. Um, it's, it's what they really need. Um, I was so um, upset recently when my sister-in-law said that she was getting a free pre-K program in Long Beach because that's where her kids go. And my wife was like, oh my God, do you believe that Lynn gets it for free and we had to pay $9,000 to purchase? So this is just like a win-win for everyone. Um, just seeing the kids be able to go in and be able to share items, uh, be able to distinguish between letters and numbers, um, uh, just go through the functionings of a normal classroom day. I can't tell you how many um, CST meetings and, and BST meetings and RTR meetings we've sat through looking at certain children and saying, hey, what's going on here? One of the first things that we say is, did this child attend pre-K? And sometimes children that come to North Babylon their first experience is walking into this kindergarten classroom. And sometimes when they ask a parent, they'll say something like, we'll say, to them, hey, did, did your child attend pre-K program? And they're like, oh yeah, yeah, they did attend pre-K. But it was, it was more of like a, a child care uh, program, not academic. So the fact that we have students here that will be able to distinguish between numbers and letters and be able to understand concepts of print and be able to know that when you hold the book up and you can, you know, you read from left to right and this is the way that you hold it. I mean, you know, every now and then you get a kid that's holding the book up upside down. It's not because they don't realize it. Um, it's just because this is what they haven't been exposed to. Um, so wonderful program. I was so excited. I wasn't vetted for this committee. I volunteered for it. So it was wonderful that I was able to be on it. And I went on it because we actually um, facilitated the program. There's a lot of other things that go into it as far as the structure of what the program looks like. How are they arriving? What time are they arriving? What time are they leaving? How do we get it so that they're you know, in with the other kids uh, as far as specials and things like that. But this plan uh, encompasses all of that. So, you know, I, I think it's a win-win no matter what. It's just so positive that this is finally getting to us. And I only wish I had it for my own children because then I wouldn't have had to pay for it. So. <laughs> and I never took my mask off. I know. You can have a mask right so um, transportation was a big topic in our conversation, and it has been a, a, in, in the committee and conversation as we talk to parents about um, pre-K. And so we wanted to kind of address that right from the get-go. We cost out how much does it cost for a pre-K bus. Um, a pre-K bus that would fit 18 students, so it's really a van, uh, would cost uh, us approximately $105,000 um, in order to have that bus, per bus. Um, that is, if you saw our budget for um, our program, is really well outside of what our budget for the grant is. Now, some things to note of that, the district will not receive any state aid on a pre-K bus. That is excluded. So it would be $105,000 straight out of the general fund. Okay. And the other thing, we could write it into the grant, but it's not able. And the other thing to know is that the state does not require us to provide busing for pre-K. We know it was an important part of our conversation and something we really wanted. Um, and I'm, I'm sure you, Mr. Myers and um, Ms. Rivers can talk to it also because we really talked a lot about it, that we felt with 45% of our families on free and reduced lunch, transportation was something that was very important. But um, we need some guidance here from the Board of Ed about you know, how do we want to handle that. Um, the other thing um, that we will be able to do that we thought about with this transportation situation is we will be able to provide, hopefully with this 10% money, to bring in one of those organizations to assist us with some pre-pro-morning uh, pre um, care and post-school care 
um, at no cost if we're able to get a, a group to do that for us. So if a family, because of uh, transportation, really needed an earlier pickup or drop off because of their schedule, we might be able to work that out for them. So we'll come back to that later, but it's something I wanted you to ponder. So what are our next steps from here? Our next step is we need to determine the number of students we can serve. Because remember, although we have that money, we need to think about human resources and we needed to think about space. So I know we are talking about housing this at MGB, and Mrs. Lark has like two to four rooms that you feel next year. Yes, two to four rooms would be the, the, at least what I think is the best. But I think, again, what we've been talking about, it has to do with how many people actually are interested in it. Right. right, so we have the space for that. Um, we have to think about staffing. Um, what, you know, teacher, you know, hiring a teacher for that, what does that look like, a paraprofessional for the rooms? Um, then we need to talk about possible future growth. So one of the things that we're talking about is that we know this is a little late in the year, and some people already have their plans for next year, and some people already have situations set up that we may be a little late in getting this out to families that already have their situation set up. But we know, or we hope, that this program is going to be so dynamic and parents want to take advantage of the free pre-K that their program will grow. So we'll have to think about as we move forward, as the numbers come in, what does that look like and, and how do we ship that? And then we also have to think about the expenses for pre-K funding uh, that, that will go beyond pre-K funding because although, again, $6,000 a student, it may not cover all of the costs. Now, good news is because we have the stimulus money, and you'll see that in the next presentation, we were able to put the cost of um, furniture and materials, curriculum materials, and all those fun things that they talked about in the rooms out of that stimulus money because many of our pre students coming into pre-K have a learning loss because there was no, everybody was home last year. So we can put that money in there. So that can come out, but the staffing is definitely going to be a cost factor here that we need to discuss um, with the Board of Ed and, and how we want to um, handle that moving forward. So we, we developed a rough timeline because we really need to get moving quickly. That's why we wanted to present to you tonight. We're presenting you tonight. We have a flyer that is actually in the back of the room that has information about pre-K and it will be up on our, um, our website tonight. If this is a good go, I'll pull back if the board says, no way, Kim, you're crazy. Mm -hmm. um, but it would be for an informational meeting on June 14th for anybody in the community that would like to meet with us um, via Zoom to talk about what pre-K looks like and, um, what do they you know, want to do? And the committee will be there. We'll be sending out an interest form so that we can see who really wants to come and what we're talking about so we can prepare for it. Then um, we'll have the interest forms due by July 2nd. And the reason why this is important is because if we have, we determine as a group that we say we can only do, um, have two classrooms for 30 students. And let's say we get 50 um, people who are interested According to the state regulations on this, we can have a lottery for the open seats. And we decided we would want to do that lottery live on Zoom so everybody sees you know, how the, the lottery was done. Um, and we would want to do that as early as we can so that people who did not get into the lottery can have time over the summer for a backup plan. In August, we will make sure that um, the rooms are set up, there's a, a, a mailing that goes out, everybody knows all their information. We'll have a pre-K orientation with the students and families to visit. Um, and then we'll have our first day of school on September 1st. That's the plan that we would like to move forward. So, what about any questions for us about anything we presented or concerns? Just um, to kind of backtrack to the amount of money that we are able to receive. Yeah. I think it was six hundred and something thousand dollars for six hundred sixty-nine thousand six hundred fifty-five for one hundred and ten kids, and there can only be fifteen students per class with a teacher and an aide. Well, yes, so okay. actually the state says we can go to a larger class size than 15, but as soon as we to. go over that, we have to add another paraprofessional. In the committee discussion, we had decided that we thought 15 was a doable class size that we felt that was going to be um, enriching what we saw from the research and experience in, in doing the program. So that's why we had said 15. So just in doing kind of quick numbers in my head, yep. it seems that we wouldn't even come close to paying the salaries of the teachers and para with the money that we are get, given back. Right, there, there would be costs outside of that. So I actually should put that up there. So one of the things here, um, Ms. Rowland, is that that $6,000 per student allocation, you're exactly right, you times that by 15. So it's 6,000 times 15, which is $80,000 per room. Now, salaries, um, 
the pre-K positions aren't in any contract and no salaries have been determined. So that would be something that the board would have to discuss about an appropriate salary for a pre-K teacher. And um, the average pre-K teacher right now, for example, through school, they make $30,000 a year. And um, so you have to discuss is the pre-K teacher um, going to, what they're gonna be paid, what the power is gonna be paid, and then, um, because even though there's 669000 you're only allowed a maximum of $6,062 per student. And of what we spend, so if we spend 80000 a classroom, we have to give $8,000 to an outside agency. So for each room we run, we have to give them 10% of what we're spending. So whether that, that could be any local agency that meets the qualifications as an outside agency and we're required to give them 10% of our, what we're spending um, to collaborate. Do we have, I mean, there's a lot of supplies that need to be bought, right? So that is not gonna come out of that money. No, yet. so we, like Kim had mentioned, you'll see in the next presentation, due to the ability of having this federal stimulus money and learning laws, we can put into the federal stimulus funds, the furniture, the supplies, and all that as a purchase out of that fund, as a one-time purchase, because of the learning loss category and saying that our kids have learning loss because during the pandemic they were home and didn't have access to pre-K or preschool or our program in the summer. Therefore, we're going to have this program and it qualifies for an expenditure there. So aside for the money that we have to figure out for the teachers and the paras, I know you said that they have access to um, specials and psychologists, social worker, speech language pathologists. Is that an additional, um, are we looking to hire additional staff or the staff? So, yes. so, so the staff at MGV would now have an additional caseload of say four classes possibly? If I can interrupt for a second. Uh, we still, with CPSA still in place, we still have access to CPSA services. So it'll be a blended model. So if there are special needs students in there that have IEPs, it would be state eatable through their IEP if it was any of those services such as speech language or OT and that nature. Um, for example, what Mrs. Lark was giving as an example with library, we have a full library, full-time librarian in the in MGV. They would be able to do, like they do the enrichment classes, they do some um, maker space things in the new spaces when we're in there, be able to fit this within their schedule to have the pre-K classes. Um, we have to look to see with current staffing, how do we align, are there any one time a week openings in schedules? Because when you do like PE for elementary school, we count you know, all the classes we have in all the five elementary schools, look at how many FTEs we have, and it's not a perfect science. So not every teacher has 30 periods every week. So they may have 28 periods where there's two openings where Maybe they do some support or maybe they do some other duty in the building that we can then assign possibly to um, doing a pre-K class over at MGV. And it, it, if I could just interject, I spoke to uh, Dr. Kim and also to Jason Carson, and that is accessible. We have enough, if we were having two classes, that was what I asked. So we do have enough in the district to do that. If we were going to do a, that same kind of model as an elementary class, there's enough. Is it possible to give the board just any kind of unintended consequences of, of financially that we may not, because we're seeing this today, that we may not foresee, um, or to find out the, the cost of, okay, so typically a school preschool teacher makes this amount of money, and this is what it would be for a para, and um, you know any other costs associated with it? Because um, it seems like this is amazing. I would love to go forward with this. It just feels like it's really, like, we're yeah. hearing about it today and you want to send out something tomorrow. I, I, yeah. I'm no, it's, it's really rushed, and it's really rushed because the state really rushed us, you know, and we didn't want to give up the opportunity of having it. So, you know, we actually, the, the committee has met like, two meetings right on top of each other to pull things together um, to do this. And I absolutely agree. It is very rushed. Um, and the, the idea is, I think the big expense that we have to think about is the salary for a teacher. I think the paraprofessional salary, we, you know, if you're talking about seventy to 80000 per room, that would be the staffing. I think everything else we can manage within what we currently have or through the stimulus money. 
It's those two salaries per room that you have to think about. What do you want to pay a teacher to do this? And a paraprofessional. Who's a I mean, I think it's a great program. I waited 30 years for this. It's fantastic. <laughs> My concern is the salary for a teacher. I mean, I would have a teacher for $30,000 a year. So, my question we're not suggesting a salary for a teacher. We're saying that's the scope that runs in our district right now. So, so districts are, you know, when we do our them. research, many districts that have UPK already are using their teacher salary scale to pay those teachers and they work the same hours as an elementary teacher being a shorter you know looking at a shorter day and not having the same responsibilities as um, a k-6 to teacher is because um you couldn't possibly afford on the funding that you get from the federal government to sustain a program so that's why when kim speaks about you know what are the costs that may occur in our general fund going forward, like we already know that transportation right now would never be able to be funded through here. And you'd have to say, we're willing to put it in the general fund, which we did not budget for next year, or look at other years to see if you want to do that. So the recommendation is it's 105,000 to really transport one class. So you would need $500,000 just for busing. So Really, that's why that's kind of was on a separate slide because that can't be a recommendation based on the funding we have. The idea was that if we're given the six hundred and sixty-nine thousand from next year, we didn't want to leave any of that money on the table if we could get something started, maybe one class, maybe two classes, and then see how the funding works out. If we're able to buy all the supplies and the furniture through the federal stimulus, use the money that we have allocated for the educators in the room and see how it works out, see the interest. Is there an interest? Because maybe some people are not interested in this, or maybe there's only 30 people interested. So an example of interest would be, like Daniel was saying earlier, we may have 40 kids who are identified Spanish-speaking ENL that would qualify for dual language. A lot of them choose not to go into the program because they don't want to leave their home school, or they have a sibling, and they go to Woods and their brother's in second grade, so they're not going to go to Parliament for that. So, we have to see what the interest is out there, but we wanted to make sure that since when the state aid came in the last time, right, because we were doing our budget, that that money was in there, and we spoke about it at our last board meeting, and a couple of parents asked about it, that we got the committee together, we're able to at least organize an introductory program to see if there's interest. This is what it would look like if there is interest, and then we really have to iron out the specifics that Ms. Rowland was speaking about, like, what is the pay for the teacher? What is the pay for the power? And how much time is really in there? Is it that they get library, but they're not able to get PE and the, the classroom teacher brings them to the gymnasium to do those gross motor skills? So there's a lot of things that, you know, um, the most expensive part of it is starting it. So districts that have it, if once you start it, it becomes a part of your culture and your climate, then it gets funded through the funding and you may have some general fund expenditures. But if you don't start small and you leave the money on the table, we'll never have it. And I know the board has spoken about getting something going for pre-K um, during my six years here. There's two things in there that I also want to point out. Um, the funding requires that we have a full day program now. So programs that were in the previous funding from way back, they are grandfathered in and having a half day program. But this funding, you must have a minimum of five hours of substantial interaction between students. That's why we proposed the times that we did because it, it's required to do that. And the um, the other part of it is uh, we can say as a, as a district, we are only opening two sections next year. We don't have to say we're going to go to the 110. We don't have to do that. We can say let's start small and do two sections, see how it goes, see what the interest is, do the lottery if there's more interest, and then kind of iron out as we move forward so we at least get something on, on the ground and going to work with and adjust as we move along. Uh, like I said, it's a great program. I'm sure we all want it, but like Heather says, we need figures. You know. Well, and, and that's where we're coming to you, is that we need direction from you all about what do you want to do as far as a salary is concerned for a teacher. I have to be honest. Like we, That was a decision we thought it needed to be a conversation between you all. And so what we saw in surrounding districts is that private groups are paying people about $30,000 that are certified, some uncertified. Some school districts are paying people as a, if they're hired into their uh, union contract and they're hired on scale. Some districts have a different scale for them. So, but the majority of them, if you're school-based, is 
paying on the teacher scale, if you're private, they're paying $30,000 around that. When we ask the surrounding local scope, the Methodist Church, like those different programs. I, I mean, I know tonight for myself, I can't throw out what I would think would be appropriate. If, I mean, if it's possible for you to give us some, some I, you know, some guidance yes. so we can have a discussion at, at our board meeting mm -hmm. next week. Thank yes, you. So I think that the preliminary work that we may be able to do in between now and the 17th to gain, we would have more information for you and say, hey, we got this many people came to the Zoom meeting. Here's the data on the local school districts and the pay um, and give you more information on June 17th. But to not delay another two weeks so that we can keep moving forward should it work under the understanding that it may not financially come to fruition or be able to do it, but it, if we don't start now, we will, won't be ready for September. Are the parents going to be aware of that as they start? Yeah, so part of the information, that's what it will be. Is that, is that we're exploring? Yeah. We're having we one more discussion on the 17th. I just, again, you know, for something like that, as much as I agree with you, too, it, it makes the Board of Education Administration look like, I don't want to say the word bad guys, but if we're going to pull it away, like, how are we to judge... No, we're doing an interest meeting and an interest survey. Is this something that the community wants to take advantage of if we can do it? This is what it was, we're proposing that it looks like. I, I, we do a lot I, of this. I mean, I personally, again, being here as many years as I have in the interest level of, of this, I, I would think if we would exceed 30 students that want to be part of it, I think we'd get to a... Well, it depends because situation. it would depend on are people using it for child care, right? So... Does, do the times work? And is there before care and after care? That's one. Transportation is a huge one. I know the committee spoke about a lot. Like, yeah, I'm just, a, I'm just afraid of putting the, uh, as using a term, the cart before the horse. That's all. I'm just, I'm just yeah, just to know that it, we can definitely delay. It's, it's going to make things tighter. But if what ends up happening, if we don't use this money this year, we have to RFP out to a local, anybody local, and give the money away. <laughs> And once we give that funding away, it may be very difficult for us to get it back if we ever want to start our own program. I'm, I'm just concerned about the salary of the employee. They're going to be a non-union employee. That's why we want to see How does that work? No, so that those conversations, you know, a union has the right to seek to have those people enter their no, union. I'm sure, no, I'm sure they're in favor, but these are things that I'm thinking of as a union person. How do you work that out? This is non union well, we have non-union and union already in our district, right? So that exists already in other working classes. Like our security is not a union. You know, they're they're not the union. So there are positions in schools that you know the, the security. That's the first one. Okay, I, I, I don't want to. I don't want to. Yeah. No, we want this. I want to go forward. Let me get. Just, and there's, also, there's also the possibility that it is union, but we have a separate. It could be a separate pre-K teacher. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. 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 so yeah. Yeah. we haven't even had an opportunity to speak to the union leadership of the MBTO because these meetings and getting this was a, a lot of work to get to this point yeah and we want to have those discussions and it may be that if we want to run the program we have to you know if we have them come under the teachers union negotiate a salary that is appropriate that fits within the funding I mean, just, and everybody's got to remember, we're starting with $90,000 to hire those positions. Yeah, no, they want 80, 80 because you're getting 10. Okay, or, so yeah. 80. For the parent and teacher. for the teacher. And the parent. That's a nice start. Two teachers. One teacher. No, no, that's per classroom. Per classroom. It's $80,000 per classroom. Oh, okay. For 15. So, so that's you're saying two classes. You know. So for two classes, it could be. $80,000 per class when you take the 15,000, yeah. I'm sorry, 15 yeah. students times the 6,000, yeah. 90,000 plus the 10% we need to give away, it's $80,000 in expenditures. Thank you. 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 Yeah, so the SCOPE program, um, we, would, we, have, we didn't want to pull SCOPE because we didn't know where the board was going. So as of right now, the SCOPE program is enrolled to start next year. If the board decides to move forward, you would have a conversation with them about are they going to continue for the year because people pay them, people may want that half-day program, and we don't want to screw up people who already plan for a half-day program, or a way that they can be refunded if they want to come to our program. So can, can those focus be offered for did come this open back? No. I don't think that, we want to make sure that everybody has equal access and it would be lottery based. So that's why we didn't pull scope because you could stay in scope if you don't make the lottery and have scope as a backup for next year. Well, okay, so I do know, um, I've had to open my door for a few years now. 
all right, what we wanted to have, excuse me, my allergies is, is hot here, but what we wanted to have the UPK years ago, um, the community really wanted UPK, of course, because it's not a course. So now, my, my, it's not my parents, it's parents from over, all over the whole district. There's no transportation. Parents bring their children to the building every day. So I think they would love having the, the UPK because now it's full time as opposed to half day. And I think the salary, that could be worked out. Huh? No. So is the board interested in us continuing to explore this and start getting feedback, get you guys more detailed, work with the MBTO and seeing about teacher salaries, seeing about para salary, um, and continue so that we can continue moving towards a possible September implementation? Yeah. Yes. I say yes. 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 And are you okay with us having the informational meeting on Monday, making it clear to people that we are gathering information to see the interest? Mm -hmm. Right, because I know it was the first time. Yes. Yes. Okay, I just wanted to make sure that that was, I didn't want to misunderstand. We have a couple of questions from the audience. Sure, okay. Okay, so I was just wondering. Um, if it was a teacher on the regular teacher salary, what would the estimated cost of that be? A starting salary is around fifty to fifty-one thousand for a step one teacher. We, we usually average that as starting then salary. Then the benefits, like it would be very, it, it's you would we average about a hundred thousand dollars for a beginning teacher with benefits and costs. That would be payroll costs and um, FICA and Social Security and health benefit costs. So it's about $100,000. Okay, and what would it be for a power? Because I just wanted to know what you're thinking A power is probably around twenty-five dollars to 30000 Starting power professional salary. Okay, so I'm sorry, I know there was a question in the back. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, since it's going to be limited availability, and if I know spend more off the lottery, do you think it's logical not to factor in transportation and just have a strict drop off and pick up by the parents? Because we're going to save money. And if we meet that threshold of, you know, it's, we maxed out and we have a lottery, we just make a fair shot to everybody have the opportunity yeah. where these kids can take advantage of it. And if for some reason we don't meet that level and we have money left over, then we could visit the uh, Absolutely. Yep. And that's one of the reasons why we want to also start small with the program is because we know the first time it comes out of the gate, although we've done a lot of planning, and I trust the professionals that will be leading this, there are going to be some problems and some glitches and some unintended consequences we didn't think about and want to be able to grow the program and adjust and be reflective, like you talked about the digital language program, how we adjusted things based on feedback when we put it into place. All right. Especially that it's a free program. I think that, you know, parents can find those great off the money and possibly, you know, put that back into Transportation. I don't know if I have three children. Okay. Ages three, four, and five. So it definitely is kind of force, uh, forcefully to have children into uh, pre-K programs. Absolutely. Kim, it looks. I got the mail. Uh, I got an email seven minutes ago to do the U. The, uh, well, yeah. yeah, UPK. <laughs> so luckily, luckily we said yes. So right? I'm glad you guys said yes because we notified them right away. Uh huh. Uh huh. Okay. <laughs> it was supposed to come to the end of the meeting. I don't have it. So. Okay, so then we're good, then we'll move forward with that. I promise you the informational meeting, Keisha will, I'm sure, will be there with us and make sure that it's clear what the stance of the board is. And, and Mr. Myers, you know, as part of the committee, if you can attend, that would be great as well. Great. So we can make it clear and make sure that the message is straight on it. Okay. So now, I promise you this is the last time you have to hear me and I don't want to promise that. Bless you. Thank you very much to uh, for your service. Okay, so next thing we wanted to talk to you about is the federal stimulus money um, that we're receiving and talk about that funding, um, how uh, how much, how much we're, where we're planning on spending it um, so that you have an idea. So Frank and I will be um, talking about that next. <laughs> Hello everyone. Um, so the agenda of the presentation today. So we're gonna, I'm gonna give a little background first, and then go over the timeline because I know there's been a lot of discussion about now 
federal stimulus over um, at over a year now. Um, and then I'll, I'll give a little summary of, of the funding, and then we'll go over the numbers in terms of like where uh, we were thinking the money would go, um, and then go over some next steps. So um, just a little bit of background. So if there's two, we're gonna give a presentation today that's combined with two different uh, federal stimulus. So the first one is the ARP, so that's the American Rescue Plan. That's what uh, was passed in March. So that's the first stimulus under, under the Biden administration. Um, and you'll see that the next one is, is very similar. We're gonna do it together where it's the CRRSA. So that was the second stimulus that was in the Trump administration. Uh, the first federal stimulus was actually included in our 2021 budget. So we've already gone through that um, in this current year's budget. So we're specifically talking about those last two. And the criteria, there's some, some minor differences in, in procedurally in terms of requirements, but the, the general core of the stimulus is, is basically the same. So it's designed to help a district very, very broadly define, like um, provide education in a pandemic environment. So that would include anything from learning loss to things such as uh, like PPE and, and, and cleaning supplies, and then even things such as like technology and preparing in case we had another pandemic to be prepared for that. Okay, so. When we talk about the allowable allowable uses, so this is is, is similar for both. So um, network is the first one I put up there. So it's it's again providing in case we had to go remote, making sure your network is able to handle that and provide uh, remote instruction. And along with that is technology. So software, hardware, upgrades to both the technology that we have here on site, and then also the ability to do home um, training. So that could be anything from training custodial staff to um, in cleaning and sanitation and preparation, so also professional development for teachers and guidance counselors, um, as well as as well as administrators, really anybody in terms of preparing and getting them ready uh, to handle the next pandemic, um, which brings you right to preparation. Um, again, like implementing new procedures and processes and make sure that we're ready. Um, God forbid something would happen again. Um, we talked a little bit already about the remote. And the last one, continuity. So this is the text here is taken right out of the guidelines so you can see how broad it really is other other activities that are necessary to maintain the operation and continuity of services in local educational agencies and continuing to employ existing staff and a local education agency so very broadly defined um, and gives us ability to to do what we feel is the best priority for the for the district and a little bit on the timeline like i said so March 2020, that was the original CARES Act. We had $484,000. Um, that was included in this year's budget. Then in December, the CRRSA Act was passed, so that is about $4.4 million. We originally included that. That was um, supposed to take away existing aid that we were supposed to receive in 2122 um, when it originally came out. So if you were at the February 1st budget meeting, you would have heard me say that at that time. Um, then in March, uh, the Biden administration passed the ARP plan, so that is where we were allocated $8 million. And then in April, when the legislative budget came out, that's when we revised our budget that we had originally presented in February um, to take that existing $4.4 million and the $8 million, and it all became additional federal stimulus. So it's no longer a part of the general fund at all. It's in a separate special aid fund. And it's a, it's a grant in aid, so it's it's federal money outside of the general fund that you vote on each year. Um, and now here we are today in June, um, giving a presentation about our goals with the money um, to the public and support of education. Okay. And then this right here is just a, uh, a summary slide to show you those amounts that we talked about. So the 4.4 million plus the 8 million in total, we have 12.4 million over the course of the next three years that we're going to be accessing. So as uh, Frank said, there were buckets of where we could spend the money. And I know there was talk out there about, well, can we use this money to offset the general fund as far as lowering taxes? And that's absolutely a no. We had to be very specific in what it was that we were presenting that dealt with teaching in a pandemic and operating a school during a pandemic. It gave us a very short timeline to put this together. The grant is actually due uh, June 15. So Frank and I met with a team of um, administrators and really kind of dug down with Glenn and really looked at to see where do we need this money. And the first area really honestly has to do with our technology infrastructure. 
If you remember six years ago, we did not even have smart boards. Our technology department has grown leaps and bounds from now having state-of-the-art smart boards and document cameras in their rooms and desktop computers to now being a one-to-one -one program, K-12, where every child has a Chromebook. So we've grown so much, but the one thing we really haven't grown in is our infrastructure of technology. And because this is money that just doesn't come around all the time and improving our infrastructure costs a bit of money, we thought this was absolutely one of the best ways to spend this money because of so much technology that we're using. And we definitely had some glitches last spring as we were transitioning and of course had a ransomware attack on top of it. So we really did an analysis this year, Mr. Rose and his team, at looking at our infrastructure and seeing where was the critical things that we needed to look at. So we need to do some upgrading to our wireless. We need to replace and set up new firewalls. We need to replace all our UPS district-wide we need to go through all of our IDF racks um, and make sure there's cooling. We've been talking about this as a board of ed and administrative team for a while. We need a redundant knock. Um, this money would allow us to do the redundant knock. We need to do consolidation and cleanup. In addition to buying some, some actual other technologies, we want to buy some iPad parts and iPads for our arts and music program, in addition to our special education program that students could really utilize an iPad for learning there. We need to buy some laptops. Um, we want to buy some portable smart boards so that when we need to use large space instructional spaces that don't have a smart board, like an EPR room or a cafeteria, a teacher would be able to bring in a smart board and be able to use it, utilize that space. We also um, want to um, refresh our desktop computers. Some of them are very old, and we need to refresh those desktop computers because teachers who are doing virtual instruction really need their desktop to operate um, appropriately. In addition to that, we know that we have been bringing in additional software licensing and different programs as teachers are really now accessing and using technology as a one-to-one -one and being virtual. We have added some, some licenses to continue to keep on many of those programs, whether it be um, things like Nearpod or Kahoot or Learning.com, different things that, that our staff is utilizing and our students are using every day. So the total budget for that would be 4.4, uh, well, 4, I'm sorry, 4.1 million dollars to do all that upgrade. And based on the analysis and the work, and when Frank and I met with the technology team, this would set us up for a, a long time. It should set us up for a long time to be able to um, keep the district moving. We then um, wanted to add some personnel to deal with the learning loss. As Glenn spoke about earlier tonight, we are asking for a K-12 ENL and language director um, to help with those programs. Um, we're finding that there is um, some learning loss among uh, and some difficulty with some of our students that receive speech services, where we were anticipating when originally talking about a reduction in service after doing some review and looking at annual reviews, we felt that there was some services we wanted to maintain to make sure our students were on track. So we'd like to keep a speech teacher on um, to do some of that work. Because we're now one-to-one K-12, -one we did not anticipate that when we removed the second te secondary technology specialist. We did not uh, think about the fact that we would be teaching in a pandemic. Right now, Jackie Kane is our elementary technology specialist, and she really has been working with staff K-12. But there is so much work that needs to be done. We're asking for the duration of this grant, the, the position we're looking here, or just the duration of this grant, that we, we, we put that position back in. We know because of, of some learning loss that our AF summer AIS program is expanding. Kids who need time to do some refresher in the summer, so we want to add some additional teachers to that program. And also, one of the big things that we found was issue this year was elementary music. Because of the idea that they struggled with lessons, struggled with the instruments because of the way in which it was, we know that our students aren't as readily prepared for the upper level music as their siblings perhaps were or students before that we'd like to run some summer music programs over not money for what we wouldn't get so it wouldn't be for this summer it would be the following summer to help support those students so that they feel successful and confident in, in music so the personnel addition would be 1.1 million dollars and again this is just for the duration of this grant then um, we looked at instructional equipment, supplies, and software. And I have to tell you, when I sat down with the instructional people in the district and said, let's look at spending money, they went a little crazy. And I had to pair it back because it was so excited all the things they could bring in. But we're looking at, um, we need a new elementary reading and writing program, our journeys program that we currently use at the elementary sunsetting. So we have an opportunity to really build a nice program um, that Dana um, would be working on with the teachers at the elementary. In addition, during the life of this grant, 
our Envisions program will be sunsetting and our um, licenses with Envisions. So we would need to bring in a new math program. Instead of having that come out of the general funds, we can have that come out of this grant. We need literacy and convention materials, new calculators. We have those beautiful new science labs, but we need some new equipment, some upgraded new equipment for those labs. The UPK materials. Um, we are looking at refreshing our elementary classroom libraries and the middle school core reading program, as well as textbooks at the high school. And in that also would be providing textbooks in other languages for our ENL students so that they have text that is accessible to them. Um, we'll be bringing in some anti-bullying, anti-bias curriculum resources. Um, expanding our multicultural cultural library books, K-12. That's been a big part of our cultural proficiency work. Um, working, like I said, with the ENL literature and intervention materials. Social studies needs new primary sources with the new um, standards and new um, um, structure. We need to um, make a more robust um, primary source um, materials for our uh, social studies department. We need to replenish some of our music instruments. Um, we, you know, we said let's have the opportunity to make sure every child has access to a, a new clean instrument. Um, art supplies, because we made individual um, supply bags for students this year, we kind of depleted our art um, supplies to make sure every student had their own art supply bag so that there wasn't any issue with COVID. So those bags were used and it was great and the kids are using those materials, but we really need to replenish what, um, what we gave back to kids. We need um, our elementary and middle school social studies materials, new curriculum, we need to update, um, looking at elementary science materials and as well as ELA um, enrichment resources for $2.3 million. Then also a part of this is um, professional learning. So we're looking at um, a consultant to come in and assist with the reading and math um, interventions in the new reading and math program to support that work and, and work with teachers. We're looking at um, providing support program tra uh, training for support programs like special ed reading programs, benchmarking and data collection, our ENL and new language programs, as well as elementary literacy and writing. In addition for training and reading intervention, math intervention, media literacy, Ruler is our K-12 SEL um, program that we definitely need to do more work and training on so that we provide for that, as well as elementary literacy continuum. So we were looking at about $245,000 in training and consultants um, to help with our professional learning. I'll turn it back over to Okay, and the last area we have here, you can see, is a transportation, food service, and facility. So um, the total budget is, is about four and a half million dollars, and, and that would include uh, HVAC upgrades, um, like air conditioning for uh, some spaces, and uh, like this room, yeah, yeah. <laughs> school bus additions, um, outdoor seating and storage. Uh, so some covered areas, like we've like you've seen a lot of a lot of use, temporary usage with, we would. We invest in that so that we'll be able to use it um, every single year. Um, outdoor music and physical education equipment, um, which you can see down, down below, again, to get kids outside more. Um, and then additional food service equipment. So, so one of the areas that um, funding is required for in the grant is also providing meals during a pandemic, which we have done. So that would include things like uh, additional slicers uh, for the food service department, because we actually uh, do that do that in-house, like slicing fresh bowl cuts. Okay. So the next steps here. So, um, like I said, it's two separate uh, federal stimulus. So the next one, the next step is with the CRRSA, which was was back in December, which was actually passed. That application is due June fifteenth. So um, we would we would send that up to the state education department, um, and then approval of that we would start receiving funds um, by January of twenty twenty two. So it, there is a little a long lead time once you actually get the money for these funds. Um, which again is another reason which I mentioned before we couldn't exactly you can't cut um, your taxes in the current year because a lot of this money you'll see will be coming in the future it's not it's not coming immediately um, ARP that's the second one so there's the application hasn't been released yet it's due to be released in the coming weeks according to the state education department um, once that is out we would again go through and submit a formal application and they uh, there's no real timeline on, on when we would receive the money except to the, uh, you can see there it says not later than 60 days after the SEA receives the money. So as soon as the state gets it, we would receive it uh, within 60 days after. And then the final step is, is expenditure. So um, once our applications are received and we start to receive that money, um, it will be you know up to my office to, to make sure that everything is following the guidelines of the grant and to start spending that money 
um, and bringing these programs and, and equipment and people into the district. Okay, so um, with that, uh, questions or, or comments? Can we just go back to that one slide with the, with the two million? So basically you're saying all this stuff, is there a breakdown of what each, I mean, I know we've done many math programs and reading programs and all that kind of stuff to have some, you know, good numbers on them, right? So is, is this broken down in any way of how it comes to the 2.3? Uh, yes, we, we do have that. I mean, it's a pretty extensive list with, you know, all the, um, you know, the, the different breakdowns, because that's actually how we have to present it to um, the state is, is very... Uh, specific, like if I'm ordering calculators, I have to say how much each calculator is times the amount of calculators we're looking to spend. So um, that's one reason why it's took a lot because we need to get all of our quotes from um, and estimates from different companies to, to make this happen. And these are the highlights. There are other things in this two million dollars, but this is the, the most of the two million because it's probably like you know we probably have a couple hundred dollars in um, in one area that we needed something. This is where to buy it. We didn't hit that. Um, I stepped out earlier in the beginning to have used the restroom, but did you guys talk about who collaborated on this to make all these lists? This was all, all of this work was done with cabinet and with the um, instructional um, director's team and um, with input from some principals along the way. So it was mostly our directors because it was about instruction and then the technology department with Dan. Question um, Where did the TV studio and the technology for that? Is that included in this? It's all in the bond. All in the bond. All in the bond, bond yeah. Okay. Fully, fully suited and outfitted through the bond. Great. Same deal with the cosmetology lab. Yep. Next, next question. Um, the consultants. Uh, I'm a little bit interested in that, being that we are having a conversation about bringing in an e &L director. So if so you want to just go to that slide and I can, so for example, under the consultant, so if, we, if and when we adopt a new reading curriculum for our elementary schools, a lot of times that goes hand in hand with having professional developers to come in to work with our elementary teachers to implement that curriculum. And that would be the same with the mathematics. So when we implemented journeys, we had people from the journeys program who are experts within the program come and train and work with our teachers to implement that program. So those consultants in reading and mathematics would be to support the incoming new programs. When you look at the other things such as programs and support for specialized reading and reading intervention, that would be training in Wilson, Orton Gillingham, Foundations, Words Their Way, and other specialized research-based reading programs for our RTI programs so that we have more people in-house certified and trained to do those programs. So that's where those types of um, support would come in. Math intervention would be working with experts in the area of math, working with our intervention specialists to help them gain more research-based interventions to use with our students so that we can close the gap and close the gap in achievement and working with our educators. So these are really like PD experiences for our teachers so that we can enhance and improve our program. So when you look at ENL and dual language support, that may be working with an expert through BOCES or a professional developer to work with the ENL and World Language Director and the teachers to formulate this program that has a defined thread from beginning to end of the program. So there are support services to help us properly implement the programs and the um, interventions that we need to put in place to enhance and improve our instructional program. And we do a lot of this already happens yes. even with our directors. That and in a normal non-COVID year, we would be providing these trainings and looking to take it out of different grant funds, but we wanted to kind of take this and put it on steroids because we had the opportunity. And with a new reading and learning, uh, reading and math program, knew we needed more PD that's done in addition to some support in special ed um, that Monica can maybe speak to a little bit of what we needed there. I think actually, Ms. Rushbaugh did okay. a really nice okay. job explaining. So best, a lot of this too would be helping to specialize programs for the special ed teachers and, and the elementary in particular so that they can um, have the skill set, uh, you know, even more skill set tools in their box to meet the needs of the students in their classrooms. So you mentioned the new programs, right? That, because I think we've asked this in the past when we did get those two programs, that 
usually does come with some training from those companies, correct? It does, and sometimes it, it comes with training from those companies that you have to pay extra for. You know, they have the, you know, the providers. So for instance, like we, we do a lot of training with Renaissance, which is our benchmarking star, but we have to pay, we pay for the licenses, and then they get a discount on the training because we have to do with so many licenses we have. And although our, our teachers and our, um, our administrators are very good at with STAR, sometimes it's good to bring somebody in from the outside that sees things with a different lens and is able to provide some perspective and help us kind of take it to the next level. Thank you. Kim, I just have a quick question about staffing. Sure. So the ENL director will be continuing past this grant, but the speech, uh, music, and AIS teachers are only going to be yes, there, so, and the, when the grant ends, they are no longer. Yeah, so right now we do have this, this is in addition to what we currently have. I want to make sure the summer AIS program's not going away at the end of the grant. We have that, that's general fund. But we're seeing by far many more students being recommended for the summer program than what has been budgeted for. So those teachers would be there to supplement and provide additional staff to be able to run more classes for kids that need intervention over the summer. So at the end of the grant, the program's not going away, but we're hoping by four years, so three years by the and now, we'll be able to kind of go back to our levels where we were before. As far as the speech teacher's concerned, we felt that there is, and Monica can jump in if I'm, I'm saying this wrong, when we're assessing where we are, there are some kids that need to continue with their services, and we'll be assessing and hoping we'll be bringing those learning gaps down and reducing that staff um, as kids are you know, catching up and, and progressing at a faster rate than they are currently. Yeah, so we do our staffing in December, sometimes even before annual reviews, as you would know. So we have an expected um, you know, um, personnel based on feedback from teachers before annual review, but as we've been going through the annual reviews, we have noticed that less kids are being declassified or having reduced services. So we feel that this could fill a gap until we get those students where they needed to be, and then get back on track with our typical transitioning out of those services for our students. And as far as the summer music, again, that was about helping to support the elementary, middle school, and high school kids as they were. Hybrid music was difficult, right? It was very difficult this year. So to provide them some experience that they feel confident, it can be something that we, you know, we were running a summer music program prior to COVID, a or two, um, that was paid for out of um, general fund. We can look then and see, do, you know, where, how much are we spending? Where can we grab this money from if we want to continue it? If we want to refine it and see, you know, if we can assess it as the go. Thank you. And Heather, just to, just to expand on that a little bit. So one of the criteria of the grant, right, is to, to make sure that you don't set yourself up for a bomb once, once the federal funding goes away. So the, the only thing out of all the $12.4 million that would be a continuing expense would be that ENL director and then if there's any um, ongoing costs related to the technology investments, such as like the backup knock and, and the, the wireless. So those two components would be the only thing we'd have to think about beyond, and it's in the range of around just over $300,000. So all of that combined, which it's a lot of money in itself, but in terms of our entire budget, you know, it's less than a half a percent of our budget. So we would have three years to, to come up with, make sure we have that lined up. And the additional cost of the past pre-K program. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the materials. Uh, yeah, I'm not including that as part of the federal stimulus, yeah. per se, because that's a that federal that UPK money is going to be ongoing money that we're going to get through state aid. So that's separate. We're using the startup. We're using some federal stimulus money <laughs> just to subsidize the startup cost itself. But the UPK program is its own separate stream of aid. That no, I'm saying we'll have to continue that past the stimulus yeah. money. No, but what we're buying in here, Matt, is like the tables, the chairs, and the so to get all the startup money, right. the continued cost, like the teacher and that stuff, so would be in the federal grant money that we did earlier presentation. So we buy four classrooms. Where yeah. So stuff? for example, if we believe that have to the interest, no, because remember we have three years. So we may start and buy materials in the first year because we're only running one or two classes, and maybe the second year, if we're running three, we would buy more because we can use this money over three years. I don't know specifically how many classrooms you budgeted for in the federal funds. We budgeted for four, but I'm going to tell you that in a $12 billion grant, and in both of our experience we've worked with a lot of our grants, there is definitely some, um, we have all these estimates and we were on point with our estimates, but then when you go to actually buy, 
sometimes things come under budget. So there could be an anticipation where if we needed to buy additional rooms, we could look at, at spending money at that, in addition to perhaps some other grant funds if it came down to it. I just had a question regarding uh, the teacher learning loss for the speech teacher, only as a little point of concern, because we know there has been student learning loss that we would now lose a speech teacher on September. That's just point of concern, maybe you can explain a little bit more in detail. Sure. Why at this point? So this is, we wouldn't be losing one. This grant is allowing us to add one that was unanticipated due to pandemic and kids not making the growth that we expected. It's our hope that during the three years of implementing this, that the additional instruction and staff would be able to be transitioned out because we would be back on track with those kids who had learning loss during the last 18 months. And we would be back to our typical staffing with kids transitioning to reduced services or no services. So that's our hope. So it's not really removing one. This is actually adding one because we think we need help right now. Okay, but for the future, there's a possibility that we might not need it. The need may not be the same. Correct. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, I have a question about the reading. Are you certifying or are you just training? Uh, it depends on the issue of reading amongst the special ed department. Yes, yeah, so this would allow us to provide the opportunity for teachers who would, would like to get the certification in certain programs to be able to pursue that if they choose to do that. It would provide training on the general programs, but the actual certification process would have to be a teacher choice. And I don't know, Monica, if you can talk a little bit more about that. Or that's... We are looking into all the, um, the certifications attached to the training. It's a conversation that we're starting with special education and okay. other related staff this month. Okay. Also, the strata program does not have a curriculum for social studies or science. Not a formal curriculum, however, it's taught through other goals and activities within the class. But if you're looking for something formal, as the program goes and the students get older, yes, that's something that we have to develop. And also, I stood up here like, about three years ago and I asked about the sensory room, which was put into the bomb. Yes. And I asked if the OP was going to be hired. Yeah. I think I said yes. yes. You are. I, if I answered, I would say no yes. because we wouldn't staff a sensory room with the OT. It would be the trained um, professional teacher in the classroom as well as any OT provider that would want to use the room. I will tell you in the last. Well, that's not a conversation for here. You could really speak to Ms. Manzi about that. But I have never stated that we were going to staff our sensory room with an OT professional in there. It was always our intention to build the sensory room through our bond and then use the skilled professionals in the classrooms, the special ed rooms, and support through OT providers. That was always the plan for that room. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. Right, uh, thank you for cooperating with these. Let's take a three-minute glass so and get a mask break, okay? Then we'll come back in because everybody's sweating. Let's take a three, four minutes break outside and come back, back in. Thank you for cooperating. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, why not? But do we have do we have teachers college? No, so right now Journeys is a balanced literacy basal program. So we are transitioning to but it's a scripted with a lesson. You know, it's enough to multiply the TC. Very similar. 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 Very
So we are able to secure up an additional security. And we would put additional security. I just want to make sure you were all comfortable with that because I would prefer the kids to be in the last full day of school. Um, yeah, I, I mean, do we know the average number of votes? It's going to be very low. Primary is really low. Primary is really low. Yeah. I do the every year, and it is really low. Yeah, that's, that's, that's good. Yeah. When you say really low, can you give us an estimate? 50? I would say, no, maybe not, maybe not 100. 100 throughout the whole day. Yeah, yeah. and now there's, four, there's normally four districts yep. in Parliament. Uh, this year, the 55 is not having the primary, so that district is out, and is one of the, so I think it's only two districts that are going to be voting in the primary at home. So again, that's going to be two cities. So yes. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to keep you. So you guys are all okay? Yes, yes, consensus yes. to keep it great. Yes. Excellent. Um, there was a topic that was um, put on the agenda, Board of Education and Exit Interviews, that was asked to be put on the agenda. Um, does somebody want to um, speak about that? Do you want me to speak about the information that I was able to gather for you guys tonight? Um, so there was a conversation about um, how um, exit interviews are done when staff members either retire or exit or seek other employment. Um, we do an exit interview through the personnel department and the direct supervisor does that. One of the questions that arose was um, about board members sitting in on the exit interviews. Um, I asked Celeste to reach out, one, to check our board policies to see what the guidance was in our board policies regarding exit interviews, and also reach out to NISBA to ask um, about that. So I do have an email that Celeste um, was able to secure through NISBA regarding their recommendations for boards regarding exit interviews that I wanted to share with you guys. So this is from the, the Council of NISBA. So it basically says, like, if you have a board policy that says that board members sit on those edges and interviews, that you would adhere to the policy. And if you don't, they're basically saying here that they recommend board members not sitting on these and generally stay out of the matters of hiring and firing, etc. Um, in case there's a reason or there's some issue regarding litigation from an employee, the more that the boards involve themselves, the more likely they would get mixed up in the lawsuit. So the recommendation from this of attorneys was that really that be an administrative duty within the school district instead of including board members on exit interviews. So I wanted to provide that to you. Um, there is not a board policy currently that has board members sitting in on exit interviews. So you um, have the ability to put up a policy and decide if that's something you wanted to do. And I wanted to make sure you had the recommendations from NISBA regarding what their suggestions were. Can, can I make a comment for that? Yeah. Am I on? Yeah. That's, okay. Um, that's something that I brought up because I thought that it would be uh, beneficial to the district to be reflected, uh, especially when we look at our administrators that we heard from tonight and to think about um, the work that they are doing and how we can uh, support them or if we are supporting them or if there's shortcoming as a district. You know, um, something that I think the entire board and the district is in favor of is keeping uh, people around and consistency and I was just interested in being part of that from a reflective standpoint. So that's one of the reasons why I brought that up. And I also want to um, ask a question that I'm unaware of about the voting. Um, is it a possibility to look for an alternate location rather than a school? I'm in favor, I do not want the kids to miss the last day of school, but going forward, if we have primaries, is there, are there other places in so we have, yeah, so we each year have been reaching out to them desperately to try to change the location of any voting that's not our school budget vote. And um, I keep volunteering the firehouse because it has that nice big room there at Central. And they, they say they destroyed it, so they won't want to use it anymore. Yeah, well, the thing is, the Board of Elections won't even entertain changing anyway. And we did seek our own counsel to see what recourse or actions we could take moving forward if we have none. 
So as a public municipality, the Board of Elections decides, and every time Celeste, as the clerk, reaches out to them, they tell her, no, we're staying right where we are. So um, we will continue each time to continue to reach out to see if we can get a shift of where that is, um, where they're voting, but at, now, at this time, they won't change their replacement to voting. Do you ever get a reason like why they don't use a place like the annex? No, they, they don't really give, they just tell us no, they've given us no in writing, they've given us no verbally. Um, I know right now some districts are having a difficult time because high schools are a location and there's a regents exam on that day. So I have even seen superintendents reaching out saying we have a regents on that day and we have kids testing and the Board of Elections said, well, find somewhere else for your kids to test where they're not going to be disrupted by our voting. Do you think it pays for the legislative committee to start with the town supervisor possibly? Yeah, maybe maybe the legislative committee. Maybe we could draw on some um, on some piece of communication through the legislative committee um, to local politicians regarding this issue. I think that would be a great idea. Absolutely. Yeah. So if we can. Um, I can grab some materials and put some stuff together to get, and we can determine what direction we want to go with that and who to reach out to. Can I uh, jump back to the exit interviews? Yes. So, uh, did you reach out to any um, districts to find out if their Board of Education does do exit no. interviews? I did not. So the old, so it was just to... Just uh, this book. This is this book. Okay. Yeah. Well, what were on that? So it's important that was the boys are that. But can we get a report from the exit interviews? Yeah, I, I wouldn't right. say... I mean, we should know what's something that was going on. So I have to say, you know, that I, I shared with you the form. It's very rare that in an exit interview, an employee who's leaving would sit in an exit interview and if they have concerns or feelings of why they're leaving, would really put those to the administrator and write them on a piece of paper because you never want to burn a bridge if you're leaving for not great reason. So it's, we haven't had exit interviews where people sit down and say, I'm leaving because I was unsupported and X and Y and Z, and I have to say, we haven't had many people exit the district administratively um, during the last six years that I've been here. Um, so they all left very happy. Well, the one that somebody who's currently leaving is leaving for a promotion. So that those are reasons why people would seek employment. It's different for position. It's a promotion. It's um, additional responsibility. So if people have aspirations as assistant principals to become principals or principals to become assistant suits or directors to become assistant suits or coordinators of larger programs. Those are all reasons that people would seek employment. You know, I would be concerned as the leader of the district if people were leaving laterally, if an AP went and took an AP job somewhere else or a principal left and took a principal job somewhere else and hopefully for our discussions with these leaders that we would have an idea of why, you know, was it monetary? Was it a lack of support? What was it? And get that feedback. I'm not so necessarily sure that an administrator would be comfortable having that written down in an exit interview that's now part of a, a file. So then the last item here on was kindergarten moving up ceremonies or activities the board had asked to put that on here for tonight's discussion. Um, I did ask my elementary principals to come tonight um, if you guys had questions or wanted to ask them regarding the current events or ceremonies that are currently planned in each of the buildings. I think, you know, we had this discussion on you know, when it started with, uh, I believe, you know, all the ceremonies that were going to be happening throughout the district. Um, and, you know, throughout the you know, pandemic, you know, last year we were presented, you know, very early with the a lot of different scenarios that could have happened. Um, obviously, it was up in the air. Again, this year was up in the air as well. Um, so we just, again, wanted to be involved a little bit of the planning. And I know the last board meeting we had asked to, um, you know, just try and find out what each of the buildings were doing. I know Mr. Carolejo had asked that we try and stay somewhat um, consistent um, in what we're doing in each and uh, every building to just make sure we give this similar type experience throughout the district. Um, and you know, you got back to us when you said you're going to get back to us and give us some of those um, things. So I thought we were going to have more of a presentation. Um, but oh, I'm sorry. I mean, I guess if I don't know, maybe the principals want to share what they're doing in each one of the buildings for kindergarten and 
fifth grade. I don't know if that's what the plan. I'm not saying that that's what I'm not no, we agree. Not not, no, we'd like to know what's going on. Okay, I'm going to speak first. Hi, I'm Nick Valley Jackson, principal of Belmont Elementary School. Um, at Belmont Elementary School, we have never had kindergarten moving up sounds. What we've had is called kindergarten uh, special persons day, where um, parents would come up to the school and the kids would sing a little song. Um, and then we changed that pre COVID, say the past two to three years prior to COVID, we had where parents would come up and complete an activity with the students. So we're not doing that this year. This year we have um, their singing, it's video, and they're singing to Frozen, Let It Go, and said it's called Time to Go. You know, let it go. <laughs> so that's what we're doing for kindergarten. For anyone, fifth grade? Fifth grade, we're doing the most. Okay? Because, like you said, last year we didn't have, we only were able to do drive through. So this year we're doing both. We're, we're having ceremonies, and because it, the guidance has continuously changed like this, all right? So um, we're all similar, we're not all the same. So at, at Belmont, uh, we're planning for um, two outdoor um, um, ceremonies if it doesn't rain. And then I have four separate inside if it rains. I'm currently working on having tents outside if it rains so we can stay outside. But that's in the works. So that's Belmont. Is that with parents? No. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> yes, that's what parents. Well, fifth grade parents are coming. Okay, so fifth grade parents are coming. Okay. Parents are coming, and we had two parents um, per child, per family, across the board. We asked, did the numbers increase on that? I'm getting ready to say that. So, <laughs> so with the changes, there's we have to, and the changes just occurred. It yeah, yeah. just occurred. So we have to have a conversation about what the number will be now, because we had a conversation with the superintendent, and we're uh, understanding that we may be able to increase it from two to three per family, or even four per family. Yeah, right. The guidance now is under 500 now, you're not required to COVID test or be vaccinated or do. So you have the opportunity to get these things more. And you and I happened to have a conversation this afternoon that written guidance would come out to you guys letting you know that as these things continue to morph, if you have opportunities, that you could morph your program to meet what the guidelines under 500 you don't have to COVID test or do questionnaires you you can have under you have to be 33 percent of your capacity you have to sit socially distant you don't have to have masks anymore because outdoor and you can go up to 500 without testing and i'm glad our biggest class size is fifth grade biggest class size like total number of students in fifth grade 57 so you still have to maintain social distancing yes. so if you have four seats that the next four seats have to be six feet away, otherwise you're close contact, should there be a problem. So just because it says that number, physically you have to be able to lay out four sets, six feet apart, each grouping. So yeah. okay. that's the situation as well, let's look into that. Well, yeah. I just want to see as many people come to these end of the year celebrations as possible. And I think that everybody 
increased fuel can be socially distant. And if we're not outside and it's beautiful, why can't we go outside? Yeah. Well, may I say something? No, because how many days are left before school? But these um, things keep changing. Right? They keep changing. And they, and they do keep changing. The, oh, here's, a, here's a problem, okay? The children, right? We're practicing a certain way. So we can change. The guidance can change. But to get your fifth graders to change and, and, and what you've been practicing on this side of the building to now say, no, we're going to go out over here, that could be a, that could be a, a problem. And kids are there. And then if it rains, you're back inside. And then you have to make sure you maintain the number. Well, I think everybody understands that we do it for the high school, that if it rains, that's what happens, and we drop down. But I think for outside, if we went as much as we could to give people after this long year and half the experience, you know, at this point, things are opening up. We understand that things are changing. We understand that. But I don't see anything changing for the children. Maybe your layout for parents might change. I personally would like to see the most people that we can get there. Well, let me see. I know I can't hold people in my little small auditorium, but we're outside. You just said outside. But, yeah, I mean, we are outside if it doesn't rain. If it's raining, right. if it's, it's raining. Right. You have to do that. And I think that that would be so you, would, you would have to do separate ceremonies. Would, I would have to do four separate ceremonies inside. Right, no, but they would be allowed to have two people per place. Yeah. Right. I'm, not going, yeah. I'm going to say MTV has never been outside and we didn't plan to be outside. We're planning to be inside in our auditorium where we've always had the moving out. We don't want to become that, but times have changed and we want to get these parents out there. Uh, right. Right. Yes, but so I'm going to work together. Right. And this but is what we always discuss. You know, we'd like to have more parents out there. And how we've never had an outside before. But, 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 but you know what? But, but, you know what, Mrs. Carolina? May I say that there's a difference? in NGV's auditorium versus, say, Belmont's auditorium. So she has the ability to hold more people in her auditorium than I do at Belmont. Not much more. You know? Not much more where you can hold that so you can bring mommy and daddy and bring grandma. But can I ask you a question? Can you do it outside? Do we even see it again? Yeah, excuse me. I'm going to discuss this in one minute. Allow them to finish their oh, I'm all right, so at Toluca, we are also going outside. Uh, we decided that we would do the ceremony without our rain gate because we just. Okay. okay. You see me better now? Perfect. 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 Can't necessarily always just take a day and then the next day off. That was our thinking. So what we did was it'll be outside. At the time, the guidance was two. Like I said, we do four. We could do four, but if we did that, we still have to keep the six feet separation. The kids act as a cohort, so they would get to sit along on the side. But to what Mr. Jackson just said, I'll give you a perfect example. If you know Deluca, we have the blacktop area, which is where we're going to set up the outdoor ceremony. We had a track that we painted on the outside, and the kids were going to follow that track to pomp and circumstance. If I and right now the seats are set up that they fit within those boundaries. If I do four seats and six feet apart, we probably would change the venue. It's not not a huge deal, but it does change for the kids where they get out, where they walk around, what they practice. So those are the kinds of things that we're going to work on logistically. That's why for us, if it's constantly moving target, it's hard for the kids to get ready for something like that. That said, if it does go indoors, and I did put out in my notice to the community, um, then we have to break up a little different. We have to break up to two. I have a larger space, you know, that I have the APR that opens up. So I can get two classrooms worth of uh, parents inside socially distant and then have two ceremonies on that day. Um, and then as for kindergarten, we've always had, at least since I've been here and long since before, we had a single, a lot like you talked about, the parents would come in, they would be sitting in the audience in the APR, the kids would sing, they get um, certificates of completion, and it's uh, an entire ceremony. We didn't do that because 
if you know from the perspective of how much time it took to get the fifth grade to be able to get one song in and be able to practice that, our kindergartners normally take about a good month and change to get three songs in. So we weren't going to put them out into the hallway, worry about stuff at the time, they had to sing with masks. So we went with a video presentation where the teachers have been taking pictures of the kids all throughout, as well as a picture with, um, they have the PTA for us has purchased a cap and they hold it the certificate. And so the parents have a picture in that, that video presentation. The only place or the only thing that we've done a little differently is because there was an opportunity to keep parents, um, we're doing like a little parade where the kids are gonna walk on the bus loop and they're, we're opening it up to parents if they are available at a certain time to be there to watch the kids walk. Yeah. Right, like and that's it. Um, that's where we're at, Hi, everybody. I'm Celeste Archer, building principal at Woods Road Elementary. So for kindergarten, what we've typically done for our kindergarten celebration is have students sing songs, and their parents come in, and then after that, the parents go to the classrooms and have snacks. So we can't do that this year because we don't have parents going into the classrooms and having snacks at this point in time. So we decided to have students stay outside. We would record it, have students take pictures by the Woods Road sign, and put that in a nice slide presentation and share with parents. So we would share it with the parents, but we wouldn't have the parents come to the campus. But if we wanted to alter that and allow people to go outside for what we usually do, that would still be okay. Or to, or like, I, I, I just attended, I attended my own sons. He's moving to a new building. I attended his moving up ceremony today. I what we're trying to get is, the, the, the parents want to come and see their kids. I don't know if it's kindergarten, first grade, uh, <laughs> high school. This is what we want to do. We represent these people. Okay. And we're part of that. We have kids and grandkids sing. So. And Vince has a very good idea. With us, kids can't sing, you can't get them to sing. Parents would just love a parade coming through the circle, sit in the chair, clap, or take a picture. I think it's I mean, it sounds simple, but I would, I that would make everyone happy. Thank you. Do I have your presentation? I don't know if I can do it. I think it's a good idea. I think it's a good idea. These people, I think, is more better. Uh, and for fifth grade, for fifth grade, we're indoors before ceremonies and two tickets for parents because we don't have as many days. We wouldn't be able to have a rain date. We cannot have. We have the Tuesday is we have we have a lot of fun with the voting, so we're not having our moving up ceremony that day. We, that we thought that would be a great day. We can shift that to the outside unless it rains and then do something on time. I I would like to keep it inside. <laughs> Right. Uh, we, I, I I I've never done a moving up ceremony outside. My, my thing is that this year has been a total disaster for not just not a disaster, I won't say that. It's, it's been time. hard for children and it's been it seems harder for parents sometimes. So just to if it's coming, it's coming. I, I attended my son's moving up ceremony, my husband and myself, two of us. My mother would have liked to attend, but well, his problem is the best. Yes. Maybe I'm, I'm at a line as a board. Let me know. We would like the principals, the elementary principals, get the script tomorrow morning. But tomorrow, if they can, with the, with the, maybe I'm not aligned by doing this, and come up with a plan that we know the people want these kids and they want their parents and grandparents at these ceremonies. If we can come up with something universal that everybody is happy and we do it all the time. I don't know why. You never did an outside uh, uh, event before. Well, Learn something new this year. You're going to have to have that I'm I'm just going to I'm talking as a parent and a grandparent. Let them finish. I'm just going to say that. Let them finish. And then we can talk Many of the things that Woods Road is doing, MGV is doing, and they're traditional. So in the sense of what we're doing for kids, what we've done for kindergarten in the past, we call the thank you day. And all of the entire kindergarten together came and stood on the rise and sang. Families were there, the children were, had a snack with the families, and then went back to the classrooms with the teachers. We could not do that this year. We were not allowed. We were not able to prepare for that. So what we were doing is we were taking a picture in front of the sign with a little certificate and the teacher. We were doing, and anybody who knows me knows I video everything. So that was something that would be videoed. And then the music teacher just recently was working on a few very short songs outside of the K, of which we were also going to video and create a virtual presentation for the 
entire kindergarten. That's what we were doing, and I shared that with all of my kindergarten parents in a letter. They were having a special dress-up day, and that's what they were going to do. So um, that, is, that is what we're doing at MGV. That was the plan. For fifth grade moving out, we've always had our moving out in the auditorium. It's the place where our moving out is. If you've been to MGV, that is our showpiece, our auditorium. So in order to make it special for our fifth graders, we're having each class with their parents. At the time I planned it, there were two parents each that could come to that ceremony, and it was for the class with the teacher, whole full-blown ceremony, except singing, because we can't do that. We usually do that a regular fifth grade moving out. And they would have their parents there inside. I don't like to gamble on outside, and I'm, just what I said before, we're typically in that room because it's a very special room to our building. So that's our plan for fifth grade and for kindergarten. Thank you. Plus, plus, after the ceremony, with Drew, you speak to that because we didn't even get to the drive through yet. This is just the ceremony. Yeah. Part. So traditionally, Colin Place has done for fifth grade uh, an outdoor ceremony. I intend to continue that this year. Uh, everybody, come uh, all four classes at the same time. Limit was 200 at the time. Honestly, when I just heard about being able to invite three people, I didn't even know that. So that must have just happened today, later on in the day. That's what I was just told. Um, so, I mean, that's good news. But again, making these changes last minute becomes difficult. What we tried to plan all along were things that would be guaranteed because nobody knew where this was going. So obviously, if we have to make changes, we'll do whatever we can to do that, but know that it is a challenge for us as well. So Paul in place has the outdoor ceremony. We do it in the front. We have the four classes. Uh, we invite the parents to come. We had intended to invite two people per family. Um, obviously, that might change now. If it rains, we're having it on the same day because we, like Woods Road, also have that polling issue uh, that occurs the next day. So if it were to rain the next day or rain that day, uh, we couldn't have it in the gym because that's where the polling would be taking place. Uh, so that was an issue. Um, in terms of the kindergarten, uh, our, our, just like uh, Belmont, we never had a moving up ceremony for kindergarten. We never had a graduation ceremony. We have what was called the special person's day where parents and families would be invited. They would sing songs. Now, mind you, all year, we were told 12 feet if it was singing, and it was impossible to do that with kindergartners. So to prepare for that in advance, and you know you have to prepare for that advance of the kindergarten because otherwise they won't get it. So there's a lot of planning, preparation that goes into that, as well as buying the props and everything else. That's not something that we were going to entertain this year because it wasn't a guarantee. So what we were doing is more of a slideshow, um, having the kids come up. We actually changed our tradition. We were going to be calling the kids up, giving them a little certificate and a diploma, um, and video streaming this um, so that people would have something to watch. Uh, if that changes, you'll have to give us direction because I'm hearing that you guys want the parents to come in for that. So you'll have to let us know if you want us to change that. But fifth grade, all of us are also doing this car procession that we started last year because really that was the only thing that we could do. Um, and it worked very well, very nicely, and it was well received by the families. So we decided to do it again because the fifth grade typically gets a lot of nice things during the year, a boat trip or whatever it is that we do in the individual buildings, um, and they didn't have the opportunity to do those things. So we figured, you know what, let's do the moving up, but let's also give them the procession too because it's just another thing to throw in to make people happy. So please, if you have anything that you'd really like us to do, I don't want to walk out and be second guessing myself saying, hey, I'm doing this video, but that's not really what they wanted. So just tell us. Is there a possibility also, of incorporating yeah. at least a live, a live parade for the kindergarten as well? Like that seems like something I thought, did we do that last year? I think in many of the buildings, the yeah. parade by the Woods Road did it, right? Yeah. You mean like a parade that, like, yeah, like you're saying, it's sort of like, uh, you know, the cars come through, the kids come out, and do that, right? Something, something like that. Interactive. Just to have a lot. I'm not saying, but could we maybe incorporate that? For the, the students last school. year at MGB, the parents brought them up to do their picture in front of the sign. So we did invite the parents, if they wanted to, to bring the child up last year to do a picture in front of the sign, which we were doing this year, you know, during the school day. But I also think it's important to point out that any decisions we made was in, were kindergarten teachers. I had a lengthy conversation with my kindergarten staff about what they were comfortable with and what they felt 
were good choices for a kindergarten celebration this year. So I just want to make sure you don't think we're out just making our decisions on our own. These are decisions that are made with the staff and they were making many of the suggestions that we're doing right now. And, and we as a board representing these people, we get the complaints that people have put us here that we're representing. That's why we're bringing this up, you know, to try to solve the problem and work with you to get this done. Thanks. Great. I think all the schools should get grandma, grandpa, the parents to sit in the circle, bring your own chair. Kids are going to come by, wave, wave, hi, grandma, I have to take a picture. To be clear, the way we were doing it, and it was a variation on the, the parents are going to be in the car, into the, into the circle, because I couldn't, oh, but I'm just saying, so literally it's whoever can show up, the parents, the, the kids are going to be there to take their pictures, much like everybody else is doing. Well, that, just to piggyback, that was, and Mr. Finches and I had this conversation, because it was similar to what we were doing last year. Our concern was, Vermont, for our building, was that last year, parents were home. They had no choice. Most of them were not working. They were home and available to come up and do that. This year, they might not be. So there might be a child walking who doesn't have someone who can come. And the reality is that many children do not have someone who can come, even to the fifth grade moving up ceremony, as well as the kindergarten. So we also don't ever want a child to feel like they didn't have somebody that was coming to one of these events. So what are we going to do if the child has this and to be coming up to the Ingo program? Excuse me? Enjoy your Ingo graduation. Child has no parents coming there. What do we do for that child? Well, that, ch that child, those parents are invited like everybody else. If they can't come, then they go through the regular ceremony with everyone else and all the things that the children do because the experience is about the children. I hate to say that, but the experience for me is about the children. I'm glad the parents want to support us, but the event for kindergarten is about the children. The event for fifth grade is about the children. And if I have a child without a parent there, we're going to make sure the teacher, myself, or staff are going to make that child feel special for that day. Okay. Yes, I'm for the child also, but also for the parents. I just like a I, I, I'm done. Is any other board members like to say I, I think that, and I'm not sure if the public knows, support of that gets a lot of letters, and I think there's a frustration from the public that we don't answer, and they don't understand that the first time that we are able to address certain issues is when we're all together in a meeting like this. And what we heard loud and clear is that parents, and yes, it's always all about the kids, but the parents want some sort of involvement too. And whether it be a small involvement, um, you know, I think that the, that the video graduation sounds fantastic, but it would be lovely, like Mr. Van Tuesday, you're doing something small where there's, you know, a little a car parade, I believe, where, you know, but yeah, it's, 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 a, it's including the family if they're able to attend to celebrate as well. It doesn't have to change the graduation, but maybe just something a little extra in person, you know, for the kids and and, and the parents, the audience. And it would be individualized to your specific school and to meet the needs of your school. But I think what's important, just some component, whatever can work for you, that interactive, I think, part that we haven't had as a community for so long, this one time would um, speak volumes for not just the child, but for the family as well. So whatever it is, make it work, and let it be personal towards what you can adapt for your graduation, moving up, special person, whatever it is. Um, and I think it just would mean a lot um, for everyone. And I, you know, I, 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 again, I, I think you also need to be mindful that we have two buildings that have to completely pack up. And the days that you're doing the all of these which are wonderful for all of our students, we still have the staff. I'm not hearing anyone say that. It's very overwhelming. Your principals are letting you know that is is a conjunction with the staff as well. Yes, we want the parents to have a great experience as well as the students. We have two buildings that have to completely pack up and be out by the 25th. So we need to take that into consideration too. Instead of adding more, yeah. just I'll volunteer. You'll volunteer to pack my room? Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I, I volunteer to walk back on you, sir, the next week, Patty, 
when they wanted to pay me, I said, you went back to the drill ground. Right? All that happened to help out and didn't teach it to anybody. You know, the, the parents could be involved. Okay, thank you, Principal. Uh, so, okay, so I'll just end on this time for you. We heard that the board said, my colleagues and I are going to meet tomorrow to figure out how we can come up with uh, a plan for uh, parents to see their children. No, but I have to apologize too. I'm, I'm telling you my frustrations too. But at the bottom line, you still get orders from somebody else, not from me. I don't want to take orders from tonight. Okay, so well, I think I, I, I'm going to check this dish box. Okay, we'll talk about the orders from the public. Who gives us the orders? We're trying to work together. I just want to make sure that when we leave here, we know exactly what, we, what we're charged with. Doing. So what it sounds like to me, and I think we should meet in the morning, is that um, there's consensus on the board that they would like us to work towards some element of parental involvement in our K whatever that looks like, whether it's a parade okay. or it looks like so here you go. Nice all fifth graders already have yes, an event right. with parents. So right. here's an idea, just off the top of my head, okay? Similar to what we used to do with, for um, Halloween, um, Halloween parades. parades. So what we could do is have our kids like in the front of our building. Yeah. Uh, they don't have to even walk. You know, socially distance right there. So the song that we were going to sing, they can sing it, and whatever parents can come and hear it, they can hear it. Yes. Uh, yeah. And I, I think but, that's a great conversation. But and, and there's something but else. But the parents have to stay in the car. But that's fine. Okay. I, I think I think the the other piece of this, just so that everyone's aware, up until earlier this afternoon, apparently, um, as restrictions were getting released, we were also mindful, even field days, for example has been a big spectator sport. We were concerned about creating clusters of groups of people and giving people a, a situation where they're not going to maintain social distancing. You see it every day at their arrival and dismissal. We're constantly trying to keep people separated. So part of what you're hearing today is the fact that we were also being responsible not to create situations that would create a problem where people would cluster together. Now, obviously, People are, they're adults and they're, they're responsible for themselves, but we also had an obligation and responsibility not to create a situation where they didn't have a place to be separate, separate, which is why for us, keeping people in their car eliminated the problem of me trying to police people and keeping them separated and apart. So that's just, just so you know, that's a piece of it. We've talked about how these restrictions continually have changed right. and updates and executive orders. So we will meet as a group and we will discuss this together and we'll come up with a plan that meets the needs of the current guidelines and restrictions and incorporates some element of um, parent participation regarding the kid. As far as the fifth grade ceremonies, I hear each of you have parents involved in those. They have an opportunity to come. It's a, an official moving up ceremony similar to what you were doing before. You have plans, you have plans of the cranes, you have, you know, for the outside people. And we'll discuss kindergarten activity or event um, tomorrow at some point. We'll get together. So I'll shoot a message to you guys. We'll get together um, and we'll go from there. Mr. Eschbach, can the staff also be included with that? With the principal? Well, I think the principals have to talk to their staff and then come to me. So we'll give time that you guys can all collaborate with your staff. We'll meet to discuss this meeting, then you can go back to the staff, and then we'll get back together. Okay? okay. Thank you. So, um, thank you. Thanks for hearing us. Thank you, Mr. Eschbach, as far as that goes. But I think the other thing. Thank you very much. I think the other thing that we were saying also was to, and it's not just for fifth grade, I think it has to do with the graduation on the fields where it's going to be from eight to nine. The uh, senior graduation, I think that we need to incorporate as much as we can um, at these events and also with fifth grade. If it, means changing the layout or whatever it may be, I would like to see at least four people per person. Yeah, so the high school and middle school, that's an, an easy switch because we're going to be older. Yep. The limit they're going to require COVID testing. The stadium is large enough and with seating down the field that we are have the ability to bring more people in now that they increase outdoor limits. Um, and they also released the mask mandate outside. so. We will be able to do that um, for both of those ceremonies. 
if what I'm hearing is, do you want the elementary principals that are doing individual classes indoors to begin to contemplate going outside and having more people? I would. That, that's. I would like to get as many. So I said that the eighth and twelfth grade is easy to increase capacity because it already has a testing component and required a vaccination. That and we have space because we're in the stadium and we can put more chairs on the field and separate people. Um, the fifth grade, the way they have a plan now, um, I was asking Paul if he was also referring to having the principals that are doing smaller events move them outside and change them and allow more people. And if that was also what you wanted us to discuss, because MGB and Woods have multiple ceremonies planned um, where each class is having a ceremony with two parents at the um, two guests. Yes. at the ceremony, and they have a typical ceremony plan um, in a normal year, other than they would be separated instead of one large group. That would be my recommendation. And instead of doing little ones and how many of them, I would take it outside and do one. I think it's easier for everybody too, but that is my recommendation. I don't know if anybody else agrees up here, but that is my I agree. Right. Yes. Oh, I, I was just adding that we, we do yes to use technology for our moving our ceremony, so I, I would just have to get there. Thank you. So what's that? Okay, yes. But the, I'm, just, I'm sorry, I'm just talking all over the place. I can't see. Uh, the high school graduation was going to increase that to four. Yeah. yeah. I'll speak to high school. Eight grade well. people, four tickets, correct? Yeah, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to add up as many as we can fit in there. It could maybe be five. If we can do five tickets, all right, so I'll speak to the high school. Grade. Uh, it's six feet plus. Yours. So, like, if you had five in a family, you just have to be six feet from the other five. Thanks. You know what I'm so, well, we have a large space. It's like, and we do have 2,200 chairs coming, so we can set up as many as we possibly can. Count that out. See how much space the kids take up, because the kids have to be six feet from each other in their seats. So, if you have the middle school's 400 kids moving up, so you can have 400 kids on the field sitting six feet apart. Then we'd have to have a parent section on the field and up in the bleachers. So we'll count all that out and see how many we actually fit, and then we'll offer that amount per student. So um, for the for the eighth, for the eighth no grade, mask for the students, no mask for anybody outdoors. So, optional for everyone outdoors. So for the eighth grade and for the twelfth grade graduation, eighth grade moving up. I'm sorry, not a graduation. Um, for that, is there anything? Is there any such thing as vaccinated sections where they don't? Six feet apart? No, because um, that is not mentioned in the. You, if you're vaccinated, you can get in, but it does not say that you can reduce the social distancing okay. of vaccinated people. Um, I think four or five tickets is plenty. Okay. That's only if you want to go to the green and watch the island. Yeah. Yeah. I'm only going to let Evelyn speak. Okay, I have like three things. No, number, totally. one, no, number one, the weather has changed. Why are we meeting in the high school where it's air conditioning? Go to the Okay. Um, Let me answer that because it's set up, Evelyn, it's set up for students right now because the band actually has their rehearsals in there and instruments and stands and everything. And for example, right now, custodians would be walking out the door as we finish and there's class in there tomorrow. So although we're in June and I would love to be over there, probably we have to see what the last day of classes is because we are using all the space in the auditorium. Including the seats in the auditorium. But we can't use the auditorium over the summer because of the bond work. Well, the, yeah, over the summer we won't be able to because it's getting renovated. It'll be closed. <laughs> I'll, I'll let you take hold of you guys because I know you guys have a lot of thought into it. And what I've seen so far going on, it's been great. I know that parents, I you know I work with better. And I know that parents have been so appreciative of all of the pictures and the videos. Um, and I can't wait for this the end of the year thing because it's things they didn't see all year. And they're just going to love what their kids did because their kids have done amazing all year. Right. And I never speak as an employee, but I just had to say they did absolutely amazing this year. Um, uh, my concern with all of this and more people is where are these people going to the bathroom? If you have them moving up and there's kids in school, are people going to go in the building and use the bathroom? I know it sounds stupid, but there, we have been so careful all year long, 13 days. It, it, Where are they going for the high school graduations outside of the football fields? 
So there's outdoor separate bathrooms in the stadium that go from the outdoor and nobody has to enter the building at the stadium. So, so, the issue that's more logistics. That's more logistics and, and porta potties. Sharing a porta potty during COVID is not an acceptable thing to do. It would have to be disinfected after each use. So we have to. We'll discuss logistics at a different point, but we'll have that conversation. Okay, and then my friend who was here who had to leave, she did text me her question. She wants to know, and I'll tell you exactly what she said. Um, she just wants to know if parents are going to be allowed to have a choice um, if masks are mandatory next year. As of right now, I know they're not, there's no decision for next year, but their concern is some districts are now giving parents a choice of whether or not their kids. This no, so there's no parents that are, there's no district anymore that's giving a choice. So there were two districts regarding indoor mask mandates that um, over the weekend, given a letter from Friday from Dr. Zucker, from the Department of Health went to the CDC stating that New York State was interested in lifting indoor mask mandates and making it optional on Monday if the CDC didn't have any data or science that contradicted New York State doing that. That was sent on a Friday afternoon. Um, communication was sent back to New York State from the CDC that said, we do not recommend you changing indoor mask requirements in schools at this point. Um, the state ed department then came out with guidance um, on Sunday stating that indoor mask requirements needed to stay in place. Two districts um, had board meetings and their board um, by resolution decided that they would make indoor masks optional. Those districts made masks optional for Monday and were contacted by the end of school on Monday by um, the state ed department and were told that they were going to have sanctions put in place, such as loss of federal and state aid and possible closure of their schools if they did not implement the guidance of New York State. So both districts that I'm aware of, which are Massapequa and Sachem, sent out retraction letters saying that based on the state telling us we were going to be sanctioned, we are now a mask indoor district. So there are no districts out there that have masks optional um, on Long Island at this point at all. So the state education regulation that comes in is like any regulation given to us by New York State. And as this board are state officials as voted in and myself, we all take oaths to implement the state ed guidelines. And also as a licensed professional through the state, we're required to implement the state guidelines. It would be as if any guidelines, such as graduation requirements or requirements for testing. So for example, this year, the state decided that you could have um, regents exams be optional for certain students. And they, if they wanted to take them, they could have not, they could get an E, which would be an exam. Any other year, if this board decided to say, hey, we're gonna vote and we don't want our kids to take regents, it wouldn't be allowed because it's a state requirement for graduation and we could have sanctions or we could have an entire graduating group of kids not get New York State diplomas because they have to be authorized by the high school principal. So this regulation of masks, whether you agree with it or not, is something that the state education department put upon us. And as officials of the state, we are required to implement. And those districts that try to make it optional, and optional were contacted and told they could. And my last question, um, if you were looking at a new director of ESL, what was in that part of the budget process? So when we were going through budget and we knew we had um, federal stimulus funds, we were already planning in our mind where we were going with this particular um, position. And having a start off of using some of these stimulus funds would be a great way to have it funded to begin so that we could prepare um, also this year during the pandemic, Ms. Musso, not only is she running the virtual school of 20 classrooms and English and DNL, it has been a daunting task. And this year we also added um, additional low teachers into our budget this year. So we didn't feel our budget because we were already at half, could handle an additional director position now. But with the federal funds, we could, and then transition it into a general fund budget. Yes. 
Yeah, I just wanted to ask about, um, I don't know if you're aware of the junior prom, the junior prom, the junior events. So just like a lot of parents are speaking tonight about sort of the feedback you're getting, you know, about not having graduation, not being able to be there. Um, I just wanted to let you know that a lot of parents, both myself, are upset about, I don't know why they're going to be a junior prom. Um, and then the junior event, which is at high school, mornings with Chick-fil-A and the DJ. I think that's an appropriate event for a junior um, yeah. and uh, an activity that the kids are excited about. And actually, it was planned on with the junior class representatives and the school advisors. So um, that was what came out of the recommendation. And we were able to, during that time, when we're planning prompts, no indoor venues were allowed. We were able to secure Outlook Beach for the senior prom. And with no indoor venues being allowed at the time when we were planning, we felt that this was a great option. It's outdoor. Every kid could participate. It has... Um, 200, not every kid can. Yeah, but we only have 100 and something who signed up. And that's typical, just so you know, because we did the data on how many juniors usually participate in their prom, which is usually on site. And usually it's always let around 100 students. But it so, hasn't been on site the last few years. It's on the chase. And it's always been around 100 kids, 100 to 120 students. So we knew that we could handle that amount on campus under the 200 without COVID testing. Okay. And you know, like we say, uh, with this mask, uh, with the kids, and it's a big issue all over. It's up in Albany. They're giving us the direction. We don't have the power to do that. No, I'm yeah. sorry, we don't have the power. To, we look how we look, uh, almost. Forcing principals, we want parents there, and we don't we want them to have masks outside anymore. But we can do that in schools, we do it in a heartbeat, but it's not up to us. People are knocking us like crazy, knocking the superintendent that, oh, we use the animals, you're making our kids wear masks. We're the wrong people. I haven't heard one senator from Albany say anything, or one assemblyman from Albany. These are the people that people should be aggravated at, or excuse me, pissed off at, because they're the ones up there saying nothing, and we're all taking the heat here trying to help our kids. This community has worked great through this pandemic here. It's been it's fantastic. And you know, to have it turn on the last couple of two weeks of school where people are fighting against each other over this. It's not us, it's not you. It's up in Albany. Call them up. Yell and scream at them. Get buses to go up there and march. Okay? It's out of our hands. We would love to, but we just can't. I think what's upsetting is the year different districts have did a little well, bit. But that's all false and they all got Thrown back I'm not talking about the mask. I'm still talking about the junior event. West Babylon had a catered tent, photo booth, DJ, just something a little nicer is what I would have expected. So I was a little let down. You know, it is what it is. It's not a junior prom. I was told from the advisor because um, the seniors were having a problem. I kept getting different answers. I was in touch. I you know, emailed Dr. Palm. That took a while to get back. Then he called me in for a meeting. You know, it, it, you feel like if you want to stand up for your child, you get called in for something, and that's canceled, and then really didn't have an answer. So I'm just telling you what a lot of parents are saying, and you probably don't have a big outcome because the kids think they don't want to go. There was never a big outcome. So when we did the research on the attendance, it was always around 100 to 120, even when it was on Moon Chaser or on a boat. Um, and I have to tell you, everyone is working as hard as they can to provide the best experiences we can for our students. And as we get in, as these restrictions have changed through June, these things take tremendous planning. Like in order to have a junior prom on a boat or, or in a facility, that's booked a year ahead of time. And if it's not, you know, we were during the pandemic last year and we entered this year with very strict guidelines from the state. And we are trying to make the best experience for our students that we possibly can. It's why we reopened and brought kids back in full time who wanted to come back full time. It's why. We, as a board, they, when it was mass optional outside, this board said, yes, let the kids not have mass outside for recess and outside during events. And that board, the board is understanding of that. So as the regulations change, and you just heard the conversation that regulations are changing about the number of kids outside, we are having collaboration with our principals, and we're going to discuss what that would look like should that change there. So there's a lot of planning and collaboration going on. and. Um, Everything is for the students and to try to make the best. And not everyone's going to be happy because some kids may love the idea of having a field day event 
for a junior event. And some may say, well, I really wanted a fancy prom. So there are going to be kids and parents happy on both sides. Um, some of the conversations we had about um, field day, when we were doing field day for the students, an example was brought that so many times, kids' parents can't take off from work to come to field day. And it's very stressful for those parents because their kids are at field day by themselves, and they feel bad, their kids feel bad. And we were having a conversation where maybe this is the first time those parents who can't get there can breathe a sigh of relief because nobody else's parents are there either. And their kids can have a great time playing the events with the phys ed teacher and their friends, and the parent isn't stressed about trying to get somebody to come up there or have them leave work. Or So there's our pros and cons to every decision we make in a school district, and not everyone is always going to be happy with the decisions we make. We try to always make them in the best interest of our students and try to provide a well-rounded program. Okay. Yes. I just want to thank the board, uh, but I just really hope that parents are involved in the kindergarten in classes throughout uh, the district. I think it's a simple, quick fix. We're not looking for common circumstance. We're just looking for five, ten minutes of appreciation, even if parents have to stay within the cars, but just as long as parents could somehow see their kindergarten in some type of a ceremony. Full rest of the We're going to go on with the agenda now, Matt. You want to handle I got it. This is works. It's just a few action items we got to go through. Um, so the first one is a member of agreement with the NBTO, resolve on the recommendation of the superintendent of schools. The Board of Education hereby approves a memorandum of agreement between the Board of Education and the North Babylon Teachers Organization. As more fully discussed in the executive session, and hereby authorizes the superintendent of schools to execute said agreement on behalf of the board. Motion. 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 Dan. Second. Second. Paul. Yeah. Gotcha. All in favor? Aye. Any abstentions? Motion carries. Uh, resignation, terminations, and leaves of absences. The superintendent of school recommends the Board of Education approve the resignations, terminations, leaves of absence, and or position abolish, abolitions in accordance with the applicable provision of educational law and civil service law as cited in Schedule 1. Motion? Second. Heather? Second? Sorry. All? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any abstentions? Motion carries. Appointments of tenure and salary changes. The superintendent of school recommends the Board of Education approve the employment appointments, tenure appointments, and salary changes in accordance with the applicable provision of education law and civil service law as cited in Schedule 2. Motion? Motion call. Second? Aye. Second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any abstentions? Motion carries. Um, fourth one. Settlement agreement and release. Resolve the Board of Education hereby approves a settlement agreement and release between the Board of Education and the employee reference on confidential attachment A as more fully discussed in executive session and hereby authorizes the President of the Board of Education to execute said agreement on behalf of the Board of Education. Need a motion? Motion. Motion. All. Second? Aye. Second. Jeff. Everyone in favor? Aye. Aye. Abstentions? Motion. Carries. That's it. That's it for our meeting. Thank you all again. I don't know if Dan has anything to say, but thank you all for coming out. This was a long one. We appreciate you all. We appreciate the principals for showing up and giving us their presentation. And have a wonderful evening. Thank you to the staff who presented it all. Motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second, we'll the Have a great evening.